Ah, Final Fantasy, eh? I tell ya, I love me some Final Fantasy and have done since I was a wee lad of 8 or 9 when I first got my hands on Final Fantasy 7 for the PS1. If you'd asked me back then what my favourite games were, I'd probably have said Crash Bandicoot 3, Ready to Rumble Boxing or Action Man, Mission Extreme or some such. But that all changed when I inserted the first of FF7's three discs into my PlayStation, from there on discovering a whole new world of possibilities, a game that significantly pushed the boundaries of what I thought were possible with gaming, drawing me into a massive but deep world filled with rich characters, a brilliant turn-based combat system, an impossibly good soundtrack, and more secrets and quests than you could shake a stick at. But I wanted more. I was left gasping for more. War, and thankfully there was plenty more to come. Of course FF7 was followed by FF8, though sadly it tries I might to really enjoy it, that game just never clicked with me. Certainly not when compared to its predecessor. And as for FF9, well, I've always considered it to be a thoroughly excellent and enchanting RPG, but again, it just didn't quite fully resonate with me, certainly not when compared to FF7. But then, ladies and gentlemen, in 2001, we got Final Fantasy X for the PS2, which gave me exactly what I craved. A new cast of incredible characters, one of the most colourful and beautiful worlds of any game, that being the Land of Spira. A soundtrack that I still to this day consider to be the single greatest soundtrack of all time for anything ever. More satisfying and extra flashy turn based combat, now with an extra emphasis on slow strategy rather than the more time based systems of the previous games, and a boatload of quests, side quests and secrets. Yes Final Fantasy X, yes! But this video isn't about those Final Fantasy games, or the ones which came before it, or even the one which came directly after it, because I haven't played it. But rather, this video is about Final Fantasy XII. As you can imagine, with me being such a rabid fan of FF10, my hype and anticipation for a new Final Fantasy game was off the bloody charts. I was practically frothing at the mouth. But the fact remains that I was also in my mid-teens, and therefore was also something of a dumb moron. And so when I discovered that this new game in the franchise was ditching Final Fantasy tradition to now have all battles play out in the field, instead of the usual flashy random encounters followed by some tasty turn-based combat, I went on the rampage. I rampaged around my room, knocking over small objects. Such was my fury. I didn't stop there though, oh no. I found out that a buddy of mine had got on the game right when it came out and he invited me over so that I could see what it was all about and again, like a dumbass, I didn't even give it a chance. I saw him roaming around the ester sand, felling wolves and toppling cactites and I scoffed. Such was my scorn for this new change in the way battles played out. Even the sight of a wild saurian prowling through the desert did little to arouse me. Or if it did, I was too stubborn to admit it, even to myself. And thus, by the time I left my friend's house that night, I was, if anything, more put off with the new direction that Final Fantasy seemed to have taken. It wasn't really based on anything solid or logical, I was just too in love with what I already knew, and instead of being open to new things, I simply wanted more of the same. And also, I'll say it once more, I was a moron. The charms of Final Fantasy XII would not elude me forever, however, because many months later I saw a copy of the game for sale second hand and I thought, hey, what the hell, let's give it a shot. And upon actually playing it for myself, it only took about 5 minutes for me to realise that I'd been completely wrong about everything. Because folks, I'll tell you now, I absolutely love Final Fantasy XII. In fact, my three favourite games in the franchise are 7, 10 and 12. The Dark Souls trilogy, Bloodborne, Sekiro and Elden Ring would later very much sweep me off my feet of course, with those games being the main focus of my channel, but before all that my heart belonged to Final Fantasy and no other. I always knew I'd make a retrospective on FF12 someday, but the time never quite felt right, and to be honest a reason for that is that I was a bit intimidated, because make no mistake, this is a big game with a hell of a lot of content, but you know what? The time finally does feel right, and I'm excited as hell to talk at length about one of my favourite ever games. 
a game that I've put several hundred hours into, drinking in its story, wandering its levels, vanquishing marks, collecting loot, completing quests, defeating powerful bosses, collecting espers, acquiring rare weapons, and all the other fun and engaging activities presented within its expansive, wonderful world, throughout the land of Ivalice, a land of warring kingdoms and empires, acting as the backdrop to a story of destruction, subjugation, power and revenge. It is the Zodiac Age version of the game I'll be speaking about here which gave it a shiny new coat of paint and brought over a lot of tweaks and changes compared to the vanilla version on PS2. The International Zodiac Job System version did of course make these changes first back in 2007, but with it having been a Japanese exclusive release, the Zodiac Age remaster was most fans first opportunity to experience these changes, several of which I'll discuss throughout the video. Folks, if you find yourself enjoying this retrospective, hey, why not subscribe to the channel? I make fun videos about great games. And lastly, before I begin, please allow me to give a fond thank you to my kind patrons for their support for the channel. And with all that being said, let's get into it. So I shall start by discussing the background of the world of Final Fantasy XII before covering the story events up to around the midpoint of Narbonet Dungeon. I'll also introduce and discuss the game's key characters and party members as they appear in the story, giving my thoughts on it all before delving into the game's many other elements before circling back to the story towards the end of the video. Final Fantasy XII is set in the world of Ivalice, or at least a particularly large part of it. Of course, it wasn't the first FF game to take place in Ivalice, with Final Fantasy Tactics released for the PlayStation in 1997 also being set there, though with different rival characters and factions, though my first introduction to this world was FF12. The two most significant powers in Ivalice are the Rosarian Empire to the west and the Arcadian Empire to the east, but situated in between these two superpowers are the smaller kingdoms of Nebradia and Dalmasca. And several years before the events of the beginning of the game there was also the Kingdom of Landis which would be swallowed up by the Arcadian Empire. We don't know exactly where Landis lay on Ivalice's map, but the game doesn't take long in acquainting the player with two of its former citizens, those being Bash von Ronsenborg, who after Landis's annexation would go on to serve and defend the royalty of Dalmasca, and his brother Noah, who would go on to serve as a judge for the Empire. However, Landis was not to be where the Empire's appetite stopped, because their westward advancement continued into Nebradia, a peaceful land whose prince had recently joined in marriage to the princess of its neighbouring land, Ashelia Benargan Dalmasca. The game begins with scores of allied soldiers defending Nalbana Fortress located on Nebradia's border, led by the prince and Captain Bash so as to repel the invading Empire. This is a result of the Empire attacking the Bradius capital, Nabudis. Although you don't actually see the events at Nabudis take place, or get much information on what exactly happened at this early stage in the game, the destruction of Nabudis is a very significant event in the game's story, having ramifications on the Empire's actions and ambitions for years to come, because rather than the downfall of the capital coming about purely as a result of conventional military actions, both it and the surrounding region were obliterated by a mist explosion brought about by an artifact called the Midlight Shore a type of deifacted nethocyte, with the term deifacted meaning made by the gods, a nethocyte being a special stone designed to absorb mist energy. Mist itself is a very mysterious force in this game, and in fact there are a great many very mysterious aspects and entities in the world of Final Fantasy XII, but suffice to say, mist can be thought of as a powerful, mystical form of energy, capable of facilitating incredible acts of magic and, as seen in Nabudis, devastating acts of mass destruction. Thus, with the fall of Nabudis, Nabradia's next point of defence was Nalbina Fortress, also under attack by the Empire, but alas, the remaining military might of Dalmasca and Nabradia was not sufficient to hold back the greater numbers and technological superiority of the Empire, and the fortress fell, though not before the tragic death of Prince Rassler, leaving the princess a widow. As a result of Nebradia's defeat, and with no hope of overcoming the overwhelming forces threatening Dalmasca, who was next in line for invasion, 
King Ramanes would agree to sign a peace treaty which would allow his kingdom to retain some semblance of sovereignty, though one which would ultimately be a puppet of Arcadia. This is the point where the player first gets control, playing as a young Dalmascan soldier named Rex, led by Captain Bash and his men, who have arrived in the now Arcadian controlled Nalbana fortress which was agreed to be where King Ramanes would sign the peace treaty, except Bash and his allies suspect treachery, believing the king to be in great danger. The captain splits off from Rex at one point and runs off ahead to the king, leaving Rex to take care of a few pursuing imperial soldiers, but upon Rex making it to the hall where the signing was to take place, everyone is dead, including the king, and what's more, the culprit seems to have been Captain Bash himself. At this point, a key figure in FF12's story enters the picture, that being Vane Solidor, one of the two remaining sons of the leader of the empire, Emperor Gramis. He states to Bash that with the king being dead, the peace negotiations are now ruined, and with it, Dalmasca's sovereignty, and of course, Rex is here to witness this all from a state of semi-consciousness. Thus, with Dalmasca's king dead, and with reports that the princess had succumbed to her grief and, you know, Arcadia would continue their westward advancement through Nebradia and into Dalmasca, and from the testimony of Rex who seemed to see it all go down, the people of Dalmasca blamed their captain Bash, believing him to be a traitor, guilty of the highest of treasons, now said to have been put to death by the Empire. And all these events lead up to the current situation in Dalmasca, and in particular the royal capital of Rabinaster, where the game truly begins two years later. The main-ish character of Final Fantasy XII is Van, the younger brother of the now deceased Rex who passed away sometime after telling people of Bash's betrayal. Van's point of view gives the player a good idea of how life currently is in Dalmasca, because while we didn't get to experience what life was like before Arcadia took control, current conditions are far from ideal. There are brutish imperial soldiers everywhere. All laws and rules are now dictated by the Empire, and citizens of Rabinaster live in fear of speaking out against their oppression, lest they be thrown into Nalmina dungeon and left to rot. Van himself is essentially an orphan, living off the paltry sums of guilt he pilfers from unwitting Imperials. Also, he can feed himself and the scores of younger orphan children left abandoned after their parents were killed in the war, or imprisoned by the Empire for crimes real or imagined. As such, Van detests the Empire for taking everything from him, and in fact this bitterness is shared by near all Damascans, young and old, most of whom have suffered in some way because of the power-hungry westward advancement of the Arcadian Empire. Van's main ambition, however, is to become a Sky Pirate. Like just about every Final Fantasy game, airships are a thing here, in a big way, and FF12 boasts some particularly bloody big ones, making up formidable sky fleets which play key roles in the militaries of the nations of Ivalice. But in addition to these fleets, there are also sky pirates, non-military airships manned by adventurers who search the land for treasures, and above all things, Van wants his own airship so as to soar into the sky, up and away from the rules and the oppression in favour of boundless freedom. I know I said that the main character is Van, but actually, not really, kinda. It's just that the game really makes you think the focus is going to be on him because of the way he's introduced. You think, ah, here's our new Cloud, our Squall, our Zidane, our Tidus, but FF12 is actually pretty different that way, because rather than there being one main character and then a cast of great side characters along for the ride, as is usually the case in Final Fantasy games, I'd say about half of your main party of six can be considered main characters, while the other three receive varying amounts of attention and development. To be honest, just a bit into the game, even Van kinda transitions into something of a side character, especially when compared to Ash and Balthier. I'll talk about those two characters a bit later though. The second party member encountered is Penelo, Van's friend and a fellow orphan of Dalmasca. As such, she also resents the Empire, though not quite so vigorously as Van, being more preoccupied with taking care of herself and her friends by doing odd jobs and good deeds, as opposed to common thievery. One character she helps out a lot is a banger named Miguelo, the owner of an item shop called Miguelo's Sundries in Rabinaster's East End. I find chocobo you have there. Yes, uh, see the down stock if I'm not mistaken. Change the soil, change the chocobo, am I right? Yes, yes, different soil means different brocade too. 
Take a Damask in the rose wine. He may lack the flavor and depth of some of your Arcadian wines, but he has a certain strength of character. <laughs> it's not bad, really, once you get used to it. Care for some, sirs? There's more than enough for all to cool their throats, of course. I've always absolutely loved the voice acting for Miguel. It just makes me smile to listen to him talk. And no bloody wonder, because as I only just realised on my most recent playthrough of the game, he's voiced by John DiMaggio, who also voiced Marcus Phoenix in Gears of War, Bender in Futurama, Waka in FF10, and a ton of other stuff. Pinello's role throughout the game is essentially to try and moderate Van's recklessness, encouraging pragmatism and responsibility over his wild ambitions, though again the focus on her narratively really dims from about 25% of the way through the story onwards. She gets a fair amount of screen time early on, but then for most of the game after that she may as well not be there, which can feel a wee bit jarring, like she should have had that bit more development and interaction with the other characters from the midpoint onwards, but then she just doesn't. Even so, I still do like her and her strange outfit and quickening animations. Not long after running around Rabinaster a bunch and completing a few odd jobs, a big event is held to welcome the capital's new consul, Vane Solidor, the same man who Rex saw speaking to the traitor Bash directly after King Ramanas's assassination. With the general sentiment in Rabinaster being one of intense loathing for the Empire, the crowds of citizens initially regard Vane with scepticism and hostility, but after a rousing speech about peace and endeavouring to defend Dalmasca, etc, the crowd goes wild and you think, hey, maybe this Vane guy won't be so bad, I'd sure like to kiss him on the lips. He's even nice to Miguel, but spoiler alert, no. He's not a good guy at all, and does absolutely nothing to help or improve conditions in Dalmasca whatsoever. In fact, he makes literally everything much worse, intentionally. Vane Solidor is Final Fantasy XII's main antagonist. His character and true nature get expanded on as the game progresses, which I'll discuss more later on, but suffice to say for now, for a Final Fantasy antagonist, he's kinda grounded in a sense. There's nothing flamboyant about him, and whenever he speaks it's in a calm, refined manner, giving him a distinctly cold, psychopathic statesman type vibe, which, while not being as entertaining or badass as the likes of Kefka, Sephiroth or Seymour, still make for a very intriguing character, though certainly not the most memorable. Van, however, has a plan, that being to sneak into the palace while everyone is distracted by the festivities, so as to nab himself some treasure to go towards the purchase of an airship putting him one step closer towards becoming a sky pirate, though as ever, Penelo counsels against any dangerous acts against the Empire, and as ever, her counsel goes unheeded as Van enacts his plan, travelling through Garamsife waterway beneath the city to infiltrate into the palace with the aid of a magic stone given to him by his friend Dallin, who lives in Lowtown, where Rabinasters especially impoverished and downtrodden reside. After fighting through swarming multitudes of bats, rats and even a rare species of fish in one place, Van makes it into the palace to where gaggles of servants toil away to ensure the feast above runs smoothly, and with the help of a nearby Sikh, manages to make it up the stairs past the guard in what might be the dumbest minigame I've ever played, and the stealth shenanigans only continue on from there. I'll talk more about the game's world and levels further on, but it often throws in various level specific mechanics and minigame type activities to make different places feel distinctive, and you get a taste of that here, where you have to lure out the guards to alter their positions so as to allow you to progress further towards the location of the treasure. Again though, it's kind of clumsily done, I mean, the objective is to avoid the guards, yet you can just walk directly in their line of sight in several places. As long as you don't get right up in their grill, they won't do shit. Van does make it to where old Dallin instructed him to go through, using the crescent stone to open the way into the treasury, bringing him directly to an ancient relic of Dalmascan royalty, at this point known only as the goddess's magicite, though a bit later on in the game its true name becomes revealed, that being the Dusk Shard, one of three known deifacted nethesites, with its counterparts being the aforementioned Midlight Shard responsible for the devastation at Nabudis and the Dawn Shard, which lies guarded in King Wraithwall's distant tomb. Wraithwall was known as the Dynast King, a king who, with the favour of the gods, conquered vast territories in Ivalice, uniting them all into one peaceful kingdom, known as the Gortean Alliance. 
Wraithwall gifted the Dusk Shard to House Dalmasca to forever signify that the Damascan royal family were descendants of the Dynast King, and the same gesture was done unto House Nebradia, giving them the Medlite Shard, while the Dawn Shard was kept secluded and well guarded. I wouldn't say that FF12's plot is super complex or anything, but if you're not paying attention, it's very easy to be left confused by the names of all the kingdoms and kings and relics and continents and such, many of which sound kind of similar. Not even an hour into the game and you're hit with Nebradia, Nalbana and Nabudis, and it can get a bit discombobulating. Back to Van and the palace though, because right as he steals the treasure which as far as he knows at that point, is simply that, treasure. Not one but two of the game's other party members are introduced, Fran and Balthier, who also have an eye for the treasure. Not only this though, but this happens to be the night where the Dalmascan resistance have chosen to launch an attack on the palace. See, while the Arcadians do occupy Dalmasca, there are still insurgency cells dotted around the land who receive funding from unknown sources, strategically striking out at the Empire at what seem like opportune times, though on this particular night, the Arcadian military seem to have been anticipating an attack, with the enormous airship, Ifrit, already there and poised for defence. FF12 features many monster staples of Final Fantasy like Flans, Behemoths, Marlboros and much more, though there's also some which do not appear in the traditional sense but which are still referenced, specifically in the names of airships, like in the tutorial level you fight a small aircraft with the code name Tonbury, and the game's largest airships are given names of notable summons from the previous games like Ifrit, Shiva, Leviathan and much later into the game even Bahamut. Van joins forces with Fran and Balthier to escape the havoc, making it back to Garamside waterway so as to return to Rabinaster's surface, and it's very nice to have some extra company here because Balthier is absolutely my favourite party member and one of the best characters in the game, though there is two or three others I enjoy even more. Balthier is exactly what Van aspires to be a sky pirate, with his own enormous airship with which he travels freely throughout Ivalice, getting into all manner of scrapes and adventures towards the goal of collecting grand treasures and profitable loot. At this point there's really nothing more told to you about his past, though later events in the game reveal that he had a very different previous life, though I guess the fact that he has an English accent might be a bit of a giveaway at this point because if you haven't noticed yet, Dalmascans all have American accents and the Arcadian Imperials are all English. I guess because a refined English accent lends itself well to sounding more evil and stuff, I don't know. Like I said earlier, a bit into the game Van kind of steps out of the spotlight to give way to other characters, and Balthier is certainly one of those characters. He gets screen time, dialogue and meaningful interactions with the other party members, and he has a very enjoyable character arc where he gradually evolves from a greedy, treasure hungry sky pirate into someone far more concerned with making a difference and fighting back against the Empire and such, though the thing that makes it all so enjoyable is how great his voice acting is. You're sky pirates? So you have an airship? It's both here. Listen, thief, Van, if you ever want to see your home again, you'll do exactly as I say. Myself, Fran, and you, we're working together now, understood? Although it's a rather ridiculous thing for a 31-year-old man to say, I think Balthier's really cool and suave with wry, dry and witty dialogue, always sounding refined, collected and intelligent. Any cutscene is instantly made more enjoyable when Balthier's there, and as you learn more about him, he just becomes more interesting and likeable. As for Fran, she's the only non-human in the party, being of a race of wood-dwelling beings known as the Viera. The Viera are one of the more rarely seen races throughout Evil East, though I think the Numo are probably the rarest because you really don't see very many of them at all. And as for the Gareth, you literally don't see any of them outside their village of Jahara, located in Osmond Plains on the Kurwan continent. Bran is also a very cool character, but in a very different way to Balthier, being far less verbose and far more serious, and speaking in such a way so as to deliver the maximum amount of meaning and depth with the smallest number of words. Regarding the serious aspect of her personality, I don't think you see her crack a smile a single time in the whole game though a good reason for her severe nature is that she's actually an outcast. You visit the Viera a good bit further into the game, residing in Eryut village, hidden within the green depths of Golmore jungle, where it quickly becomes clear that they detest outsiders, particularly Humes. 
Furthermore, the Vieira have a unique connection to the woods and as such believe that all Vieira should remain there their whole lives, with the punishment for venturing outside being banishment, which is exactly what happened to Fran. Her relationship with Balthier is never explicitly explained or how they even met, but they seem to be pretty, you know, friendly. Hmm? I earlier spoke of my inexplicably shitty first impressions of FF12, but here's another for you. I used to hate Fran, and that's because of her accent, which as far as I know, sounds like no other accent on earth. It's like the voice actress just created a new- whoa. Uh, sorry, it's like she just created a new accent for the character, which I genuinely think is extremely impressive, but yeah, for whatever reason, the accent used to annoy the shit out of me when I was younger. I don't know why, because I think it sounds great now. I've heard the voice of the wood. She says Mierin is not in the village. Jyote, where has she gone? Why do you ask? The wood tells us where she has gone. Or... Can you not hear her? It's not long before the team encounter yet another party member though, and probably the single most important one, Ash. She introduces herself as Amalia at first, but this is just a cautious pseudonym, being that she happens to be part of the Resistance's current attack on the palace, but as gets revealed just a bit later, her real name is Ashelia Benargin Dalmaska, the only remaining member of the Dalmaskan royal family, who turns out to have faked her own death, or rather her uncle, Halim Ondor, Marquis of Bougerba, falsely announced that she was dead, which the Empire assumed to be the truth. Although the first character we play as after the tutorial level is Van, who we also always control when wandering through towns and such, most of the plot actually revolves around Ash and her attempts to restore herself as Dalmasca's rightful ruler, though at the same time she also has ambitions towards fierce revenge against the Empire, even towards its destruction. And no wonder when they were responsible for the death of her father and husband, the loss of her rightful title as princess, and the subjugation of her people. The reason I discussed the deifacted Nethysite before is that they are key to Final Fantasy XII's story. It's all set within a world at war, featuring massive empires of enormous military might and smaller kingdoms caught in the midst, and the situation develops and unfolds dramatically and intricately as the game progresses, with the player being kept abreast of changes to the larger international situation via Marquis Ondor's interludes, and from the dialogue of key figures from the houses of each empire, like Al Cid Margrace from the ruling family of Rosaria and young Larsa Solidor from House Solidor in Arcades, a land governed by both Emperor and Senate. However, as I said, this larger conflict is the setting, the stage with which a somewhat more personal story is told of Ash's destiny, her loyal friends and followers, and whether she will give in to the inner lust for power and revenge against Arcadia. After fighting through the beasts and bosses of Garamsyth Waterway, the party emerge back up into Lowtown, where they are swiftly apprehended by Imperials, whereupon Ash is taken away, and as for Van, Fran and Balthier, they are thrown into the dreaded Nalbana dungeon, whilst Pinello protests in Defan's defence, all to no avail. The dungeon is of course located in Nalbana, a fortress formerly belonging to Nebradia, but which now belongs to the Empire, serving as a point of defence at its surface and in its depths as a dungeon, home not only to criminals, but also to innocent civilians who either happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, or who dare to speak out against the Empire. It is indeed pretty goddamn grim down here, and although there are a lot of prisoners you can talk to, they don't even have names, instead just being known by their numbers, and in some cases by the distinctive iron collars and bracelets around their body. After a fight with a particularly savage gang of Sikhs, the action comes to a halt as a judge enters into the picture, Judge Gabranth. Judges are highly distinguished figures of the Empire who act as magisters of the law, protectors of House Solidor and the Senate, and even generals who command the Imperial Army. Although you do come across some lesser judges on occasion strictly when in combat, there are six particularly powerful and influential named judges, those being Judge Geese, Judge Gabranth, Judge Bergen, Judge Drace, Judge Zargabath, and Judge Zekt the one who commanded the attack on Nabudis, resulting in its annihilation by the Midlight Shard. Honestly, some of my favourite cutscenes in the whole game and of any Final Fantasy game are those where you get to see the judges in action. 
They already look incredibly badass in their heavy armour, each having their own uniquely shaped helmet, but their dialogue and voice acting is incredible. The dialogue in FF12 is delightfully refined. I hesitate to go so far as to call it Shakespearean, but many characters, especially those from the Imperial side of things, speak in such a stylish way which manages to come across as dramatic while still being dry, grounded and mature, especially when compared to my other favourite Final Fantasy games. I mean, FF10 is one of my favourite games of all time, but its characters sometimes said some stupid fucking cheesy nonsense, which is great. I love it, but FF12's characters in comparison are much less full of that wacky cheer, which isn't necessarily better, but rather is simply a different flavour of excellence. The judges also vary a great deal in their personalities, and although the Empire's actions against peaceful neighbouring countries is abhorrent, things aren't presented in a simple black and white way at all. Judge Geese is power hungry and ambitious, seeming to possess very little empathy for others, and holding little mercy for anyone or anything even remotely standing in the way of the Empire, while Judge Zargabath is painted as someone who carries out the brutal commands of his superiors dutifully though without any pleasure, clearly knowing some of his actions are immoral, but knowing that the easiest and safest path is that of obedience. Then you have the unyielding and brutal Judge Bergen, who shows no mercy for the foes of the Empire, even expressing the wish that the Kingdom of Dalmasca be wiped off the mat and forgotten to herald in the new age of Nethesite. It controls him as it did Mjern. No, no, the power of manufactured Nethesite is the power of man, a weapon forged by his wisdom who would challenge the gods themselves. A fitting blade for a true dynast king. Wraithwall did but pretend the title, a cur begging Nethesite scraps from his master's table. Hark! Ivalice hails her true dynast king, Vane Solidor. He shall defy the will of the gods and see the reins of history back in the hands of man. His time is nigh! The new Ivalice holds no place for the name Dalmasca. The stain of Wraithwall's blood shall be washed clean from history's weave. But then on the other end, you have Judge Drace, who seems to be the most moral of all the judges, openly pondering about the morality of the Empire's recent actions and even directly confronting Vane Solidor at around the halfway point of the game, where he becomes increasingly bold and ambitious, grasping harder at the reins of power and enacting ever more merciless and immoral schemes. The most significant of all the judges though is Gabranth. In fact, it's actually Judge Gabranth himself who appears on the game's box art. You only hear his voice here as he admonishes the Banga bounty hunter Begamnin, who is on the hunt for our very own Balthir, but further on in the dungeon, while searching for a way out of Nalbana, the party comes across a familiar face. That of... Captain Bosch von Ronsenberg of Dalmaska! Shut up, Van. It's Captain Bash von Ronsenberg of Dalmaska, who was supposed to have been executed by the Empire but still lives, just like how Ash was wrongly believed to have died. As well as seeing Bash, we also see the face of Judge Gabranth, who is in fact Bash's identical twin. And at this point it clicks into place that it was not the captain who assassinated King Ramanus at the treaty signing, but rather Gabranth who pretended to be Bash, all in the sight of the wounded Rex, who would go on to testify that Bash was the traitor and the one to blame for Dalmasca's downfall. At this point though, Van doesn't yet comprehend all these plot intricacies, and so does this. Delmasca? What do you care about Delmasca? Everything that's happened is because of you! Everyone that's died, every single one, even my brother. But then later on he realises the truth and says this. Really, it's alright. I know it wasn't your fault. I see that now. You didn't kill my brother. All good then. Bash is the final of the game's six main party members to join the team. You don't have all six in the party at this point, with Ash still being held by the Imperials and Penelo soon to be spirited away to the sky city of Bujerba by Begamnin and his crew. But from the point of the events aboard the Leviathan airship with Judge Geese onwards, you have all six members and none of them ever leave again from that point on, with the exception of the game's three guest characters. 
those being Vosler, a former ally of Bash and a member of the Resistance, Larsa, younger son of Emperor Gramis and brother to Vane Solidor, and my personal favourite, the man with the pink shorts, Redis, though as with several of FF12's characters, he has an alternate identity of some significance. Back to Bash though, he's a soldier through and through, a loyal protector of Dalmasca and servant of the royal family, who now only consists of Ash. As I mentioned earlier though, Bash is not a Dalmascan, instead originally hailing from the fallen kingdom of Landis. But despite being a foreigner, his honour and loyalty towards Dalmasca is completely unwavering throughout the whole game. As a character he's very serious and never flippant, but in a likeable enough way. He doesn't exactly have the most personality on the team, but instead his personality literally is honour and duty and not all that much else, and as such he doesn't really have much of a character arc. He starts off as a steadfast and loyal knight and remains that way throughout the whole game, but that's not to say that he's bad or uninteresting because he complements the greater team dynamic rather well. And also his adversarial relationship with his brother Judge Gabranth makes for some great moments. Another very significant character in ff 12 story who I simply must mention here even though you don't encounter him much further into the game is Sidolphus Demon Bonanza, or Dr. Sid for short. Of course there's a character named Sid, it's a Final Fantasy game, but in the case of ff 12 Sid is not one of the good guys at all, but rather is something of a mad scientist and Vane Solidor's greatest ally. His main focus is the Nethysite, both manufactured and deifacted, and how they can be used to further the might of the Empire, though his main ambition, as both he and Vane, not to mention Judge Bergen, often state, is to place the reins of history back in the hands of man. It's not entirely clear what these powerful men of the Empire mean by this at first, but it gradually becomes revealed as the game progresses, and as the party venture to some of the more mysterious and mist-soaked locations in the game, gaining an audience with wise leaders, fierce espers and even the gods themselves, all towards restoring Dalmasca and stopping the Empire one way or another. Well, now that I've introduced the party members and set up for the story, I'm going to put the plot discussion on hold for now, because there's a lot of other stuff to talk about, but for now, let's talk about the world of FF12. I know I covered Ivelisse's history and political divisions and such earlier, but that's got nothing to do with how we, the player, move through it. Of course, you start off as Rex, but that's really just to teach you the absolute basics, such as, do you see the icon above my head? That's a talk icon. You can talk to any character showing one of these. Hey, thanks Bash. The real Final Fantasy XII experience doesn't start until you get control of Van, though even at this point you're still pretty damn restricted on where you can and can't go. Even so, you've got a portion of Rabinaster to explore, not to mention the first segment of the Dalmascan Estersand, an expansive beast-filled desert located just to the east of the royal capital, complemented by the Westersand at the other end, and then to the south there's Giza Plains, which is also the border between Dalmasca and Kerr 1, though that's just the immediate Dalmascan area I'm talking about because there are far more cities, ports, dungeons and deserts to explore as the story unfolds, and as more of Ivelisse becomes accessible via the use of the airship, or, as is mostly the case, simply by traversing there on foot, after which that region can be accessed at will via a teleport stone at a red save crystal. Honestly, there's a lot of stuff I love about Final Fantasy XII, but perhaps its single strongest aspect is its world, the way you explore it, the way it's presented, the sheer visual variance of any one location when compared to another, and the way so much of it feels so naturally interconnected. Let's take it all a bit at a time though. Let's take Rabinaster, where Van's adventure begins. Now, I haven't played every Final Fantasy game, I haven't played the MMOs and nor have I gotten round to FF16, though I did enjoy the demo, but from what I have played, I think Rabinaster might just be Square Enix's best city. It's large, bright, bustling, filled with life and energy, it's structurally believable, it has a very distinctive style and it isn't static, and that last aspect is extra relevant when talking about FF12, because it's also the case for nearly all of its cities and outposts. 
I don't mean it isn't static as in the form of the city changes, but rather whenever a major event in the story occurs, nearly every NPC has completely different dialogue, providing more insight into what regular people think of current events, with these points of view differing depending on whether you're speaking to a Rabinastrin, an Arcadian, an acolyte of Mount bar or a Viera secluded in their woods. Right from the get-go, there are an overwhelming number of people to talk to, though if you're unsure about how to talk to them, please refer back to the earlier lessons taught by Captain Bash. Just the fact that there's a ton of people to talk to isn't impressive on its own, because it's the quality that counts, not the quantity, but as I alluded to earlier, the dialogue in this game is exceptionally well written, and that doesn't just extend to the main characters and cutscenes, but also the merchants in the Muthru Bazaar, the day drinkers down at the local pub, or the bedraggled urchins running around in low town. Not sure if anyone else is the same here, but I sometimes have to make a conscious effort not to speak to every single person I see when wandering around the city, otherwise my journey time when walking from one side to the other can easily be made twofold. I'm saying all this about Rabin Aster, as if these qualities are unique to it, but you can say much the same about the sky city of Bujerba, Arcades, Nalbana, and Balfenheim Port, not to mention the game's outposts located within larger, more dangerous field areas like the South Bank and the Estersand, though don't get me started about the recent goings on over at the North Bank village, the Nomad Village, a geezer plains which straight up gets deserted during the rain season. Then you have the Hunter's Camp in the middle of Thorn Coast, Jahara located in Osmon Plains, the Babbling Vale in the Mosforin High Waste, etc. By the way, I love how the game just makes up its own words, like High Waste, Still Shrine, and Necro Hall. These aren't real words, but they sound good, and I know exactly what they mean upon hearing them. Whenever I would get to a new remote location populated by shady bangas, cheerful Sikhs, suspicious Vieras, wise old Numos, stoic Gareths, or your plain old humans be they Dalmaskin, Bougerbin, or Arcadian, I couldn't wait to talk to them to learn more about Ivalice and about the different cultures and histories of these places, all of which feel very different from one another and with very different degrees of technological advancement. Take Rabin Naster, for example. You don't really see much technology here at all. In fact, it's like the people here are living in a different age. The clothing and architecture all have a somewhat Arabic flavour to them, and other than at the aerodrome, there are no airships or machines to be found, only a desert city populated by desert-dwelling people, though with the troubling presence of dark-armoured imperial guards stationed at every street corner. Then you have the Sky City of Bougerba, which, thanks to the Marquis's cooperation with the Empire, not to mention the rich magicite veins found within Luzu Mines, has thus far managed to remain in an uncomfortable alliance with the Empire, and thus is devoid of Imperial Guards when compared to the far more oppressive conditions in Rabinaster. Whereas portions of the royal capital are nigh on impoverished, Bougerba is far more prosperous, with a very different culture, not to mention landscape. For a start, it's floating in mid-air thanks to its concentration of magicite ore, making for some incredible scenery, though the character of its alleys and architecture feels very distinct, being more cramped and even slightly confusing. It's not a large city, but if I don't look at my map when travelling through it, I will get lost, it's a guarantee. The Bougerbans even have their own dialect, occasionally throwing in odd italicised words where you need to infer their meaning or just look up the wiki and learn these words off by heart and start using them in everyday conversation to impress your friends and family. You can go around to your buddy's house and say, Badre, I apologise for the ha, but please fetch me a glass of madu, why don't you? Otherwise, I will here on consider you a kusudra in this life and in the nirvana. But then at the other end of the spectrum you've got Arcades, which interestingly enough itself ranges from one end of the spectrum of refinement to the other, with old Arcades down below being even more miserable and impoverished than Rabinaster's Low Town. Even the damn streets have depressing names, the Alley of Low Whispers and the Alley of Muted Sighs. Jesus, who named these places? This place sucks. And it's either where those born into poverty remain in poverty, or where the formerly rich and successful have come crashing down after making a figurative misstep and losing their status and wealth. As far as Arcades proper, well, it's by far the most impressive city in the game, but in a very different way to Rabinaster. Because whereas Rabinaster is bright, simple, vibrant and filled with good cheer and personality, even despite the imperial occupation, Arcades is far more sterile and even dimmer 
with the warm rays of the sun being blocked out by its towering skyscrapers, forming an impossibly large and complex city which, rather than looking historic, looks positively futuristic, complete with flying cars and numerous other strange obelisks and structures whose purpose can't even be guessed at. Seriously, the high resolution cutscenes showing arcades are insane. This game has some incredible art direction, which is truly a joy to behold. As for the citizens of Arcades, well, their character also differs greatly when compared to the residents of the game's other main cities, but by that I mean that almost everyone here is unapologetically a massive <laughs> Everyone's stinking rich and successful with high social standings and connections, and yet they're some of the most bitter and jealous people in all Ivalice, and never satisfied with their lot, always looking up, though always eager to flex on those further down. Mind you, just like I said when discussing the judges, it's really not as black and white as Dalmasca equals completely good and Arcadia equals totally bad. When you eventually make it to Arcades, after a frankly absurdly long trek through Nalbana Fortress, through the Mosfer and High Waste, then the Salica Wood, watch out for bombs, then through Fawn Coast, followed by a long trek through the Cheetah Uplands, complete with a descent down into the depths of Socian Cave Palace, watch out for ambulatory plant life, and after ascending above the muted misery of old Arcades, your goal is to make it to Draclor Laboratory, located in the heart of the city. The problem is that to ride the cab service further into the city, you need to accumulate chops of wood, which effectively act a status-based currency which one Arcadian can choose to gift to another as a reward for a good deed. And, with enough chops, even a beggar living in the squalor of old Arcades can rise to become a distinguished gentleman of status further above. Thus, most of Arcades actually serves as the arena for a tail-swapping minigame of sorts, where you have to listen to someone's problem and then find another person in the same area with a solution to that problem. For example, this researcher has decided that the time has come to leave the profession now that her team has completed a long-term project that her father had also been working on, but that she doesn't know how to let her father know. And so you commit the tale to memory, then find her father in the area and let him know, who then rewards you with a chop. It's kind of dumb, but I also really like it because again, the writing's excellent and it gives you a great opportunity to drink in the flavour of Arcades proper to see how it compares to the rest of Ivalice. Some of the folk you encounter are very snobby, with unrelatable, out-of-touch woes about wealth and status, but then there are others who are far more pleasant with real depth, and sometimes this depth comes out of nowhere. Like this woman who hates mummers with a passion, but then you find out that she and her family used to be dirt poor, with her mummer father barely even being able to put food on the table, and falling into debt after becoming ill. At this point, a rich Arcadian came along and agreed to take on his debt so long as he agreed to leave the woman's mother, to which her mum or father agreed, knowing that they could have a better life without him, after which the rich Arcadian married her mother and she never saw her father again, leaving her resentful of mummers and their foolish prancing, all born out of sorrow for her lost father. Moments like this happen a lot in this game, which is why it's so important to wander its cities and outposts thoroughly, interacting with everyone, like this lone Vieira sitting shyly by the Muthru Bazaar, who you can converse with throughout the game, learning her story and watching her confidence and determination grow each time. Then there's the Jovi side quest, where each time you complete a hunt in Nalbana, this Sikh will show up and literally just snort and then leave, and it's very difficult to interpret what that means. Is it a compliment or an insult? I don't know. But after beating all five Nalbana hunts, those being Atomos, Roblon, Goliath, Death Scythe and Carrot, you can see him sprinting around the West Ward section near the aerodrome, and if you talk to him, turns out the reason he kept cropping up was because Van has become his new hero after watching him dispatch some of the fiercest monsters in the land. Jovi actually had a previous hero, a Hume he'd known four years ago who saved him after he was caught stealing, but that this hero had since passed on after being involved in some way in the whole King Raminus assassination incident. Then before he leaves, he tells Van that he even looks like his old hero too, at which point it becomes clear that the old hero he's referring to was Van's deceased brother Rex. This wee quest and its associated dialogue are completely optional and quite missable, but honestly, for as humble as its presentation is when compared to all the game's grand cutscenes of massive sky battles, it's one of my favourite moments in the game, and an excellent example of how much personality the game's city sections have. Everything about them is rich.
I can't praise FF12 cities and outposts highly enough. They do everything right and they're dense as hell, with Robin Astor being the star of the show for me, which I think is a big reason for why people were so disgusted when Final Fantasy XIII came along and completely dispensed with the whole city and settlement aspect in favour of linear corridors filled with enemies, almost none of which you could even return to after leaving them. I don't mean to take quick, easy jabs at FF13 though, because it isn't the subject of this video, but god damn, apart from its graphics which to this day remain incredible, it was such a step back after the heights of its predecessor. People do talk about how that game gets a lot better around 60% of the way through, and I actually 100% agree with this, but funnily enough, I think the reason for this is that it suddenly transitions into something that feels way more similar to FF12, with its big, bright, open environments, its roaming packs of monsters, and its submissions which effectively play out identically to FF12's hunts, and even the main dungeon you explore in Grand Pulse, Tajin's Tower, feels really similar to the Pharaohs at Red Arana from FF12. Anyway, I've gone off on a complete tangent there, so let's swiftly get back on track and say no more about Final Fantasy XIII. Now let's talk about the other parts of the game world, the dangerous parts, though I'll leave my discussion of the actual combat mechanics until a bit later in the video. I mentioned earlier that the world feels very interconnected, and this plays a significant part in why I enjoy moving through it so much. Of course, some parts of it are isolated and can effectively only be fast travelled to via airship, namely Bujerba which contains the Lusu Mines, the Ridderana Cataract which houses the lighthouse containing the mother of all de-affected Nethysite, the Suncrest, and the game's final area, the Bahamut. And that's literally it. In fact, you can travel through the entire remaining game world on foot if you like, from the holy city of Giravagan or the still shrine of Miriam at the far south, all the way to the Necro Hall of Nabudis, or Arcades itself at the far north, and I absolutely love this, as well as the fact that it's not at all a straight line from south to north. For example, if you want to travel from Rabanaster to Mount bar you could go south through Giza Plains, then further south through Osmond Plains, before heading southeastward through Golmore Jungle before marching through the snow-covered Paramina Rift and onto the mountain. Or, you could be more unorthodox and go west from Rabanaster through the Wester Sand, then down into the Zertanen Caverns, past giant mantises and green slimes, and if you take a really wrong turn, the Esper Adramalech then from there go on through Osmond Plains and go more jungle, so this time instead of going directly to Paramina Rift, this time you could take the more dangerous, mist-laden route through the Feywood and then onto Mount bar -Omises. Now, of the two routes I outlined there, obviously the former one is the most efficient, but even so, these areas are connected. The world is connected in interesting and often unexpected ways. When you're first exploring an open combat area, even if you've picked up or bought the map for it, it won't initially tell you which areas it lies adjacent to until you actually move through that transition area. And it was always a nice feeling when I realised that one level was directly connected to some other that I traversed through hours ago. Like how you can actually get to the Dalmascan Ester Sand by leaving the Mosferin Highways from the south to get to its north bank outpost. Ah, should I do it? Should I make the reference? Will you roll your eyes if I make the reference? Ah, no, I won't do it. Actually, fuck it. It's like in Dark Souls, where the more you explore its world, the more you realise how interconnected everything is, and that for as remote as levels like, say, Blight Town feel, you can actually get there simply by descending down from Firelink Shrine, through a wee bit of New Londo, across the Valley of the Drakes, and then into its bleak, guttural gloom. There's a certain immersive satisfaction in discovering that the world you're travelling through has been laid out in a very particular way, not as a linear sequence of set pieces broken apart by the odd cutscene and boss, sorry FF13, couldn't resist, but as a believable, explorable world, bursting with flavour and crammed full of treasures, secrets and quests. I spoke about how each city and outpost differs rather significantly in their vibes and aesthetics, but you can say much the same about the larger combat areas, which I'll simply refer to as field areas from here on. That said, the degree of variance between one field area and another isn't always that substantial, not least of all because there are a lot of them, and also they can get really big. Seriously, some of these places are fucking huge, and furthermore, it's not uncommon for one expansive field area to be directly connected to another, and then another. I previously mentioned the long 
journey from Nalbinet to Arcades, which has you go through the Mosforin Highways, which is a big field area. Then immediately after, there's the Salica Woods, which again, is pretty bloody big, and with opportunities to make detours into the Necro Hall of Nabudis and the Nabrius Deadlands if you've got a death wish. But then directly after that, you go on to the Fawn Coast, which to this day, I don't think I've ever fully explored because of how enormous it is. And much the same thing can be said of the Cheetah Uplands, which comes directly after. The game's not at all afraid of sending you into massive field areas that are at least twice as large as they need to be. Another example is when you journey from the Wester Sand to the Tomb of Wraithwall, so as to reclaim the Dawn Shard, requiring you to move through the Ogre Yensa at Sansi, which is a silly size. But then directly after that, you have to move through the Nam Yensa Sansi, which is about just as big. It can get pretty overwhelming, though the nature of these areas really does help to mitigate the feelings of fatigue that can crop up after you've killed your 50th Silver Lobos, your 100th Serpent, or your 200th Uritan Yensa. For a start, FF12 is a damn good looking game. Of course, I'm playing the remastered Zodiac Age version, which markedly improves the graphical fidelity, but even back on the PS2, it was impressive as hell being released towards the end of the PS2's life cycle, as the PS3 was coming out along with other great looking games of that generation like Resident Evil 4 and God of War 2. My praise extends far beyond sheer graphics though, because it's the game's art design and set pieces that really seal the deal. The field areas are all divided into segments, all of which are connected by transition zones which take you into the next segment, which I guess was simply a technical necessity back in 2006, as opposed to the possibility of having it all be one large open area, perhaps more akin to Grand Pulse from FF13. However, with each field area being caught up in such a manner, even different segments within the same larger field area will often have quite different aesthetics and landscape characteristics to each other. I mean, compare the northernmost parts of the Feywood to the southernmost parts. They both share the same densely misted aesthetic, but where the northern part is more labyrinthine and confusing, the southern part is more open, even featuring its own level mechanic requiring you to stand in these shrines so as to sequentially reveal the path forward. Or, compare the Paramina Rift's frozen brook with its frosted over river to the heights of the spine of the ice worm, where holy Garudas fly far above the lower sections. There's a lot of variability to really keep it interesting when moving through these areas, though I'm certainly not saying that this is always the case. I mean, most of the Ogre Yensa Sansi looks the same as all the rest of it, and you can say much the same about its Nam Yensa counterpart, though that's not to say that these particular areas are dull to move through. For a start, the whole place literally is situated on a constantly shifting sea of sand, which looks very cool. Your traditional dungeon type levels can get somewhat repetitive to look at though and play through, like Luzu Mines, Hen Mines, Barheim Passage and certainly Drakthor Laboratory, though at the same time, these levels also do have their own specific mechanics, like how you need to take care of the battery mimics in Barheim Passage so that there's enough power to operate the gates to progress further through the level. And for as dingy and uninspired as a lot of that level looks, even it has highlights, like this long bridge section which I think looks great. Some field areas do kind of blend in a bit though, particularly Cheetah Uplands and Sorobi Steppe, which are just really big and grassy and not especially distinctive and interesting, at least when compared to places like the Nabrius Deadlands, Giru Vagan and the Great Crystal. And speaking of the Great Crystal, both that and the Pharos at Ridorana are for sure the two most unique levels in the game, for better and for worse, to the point where I don't exactly know if I like them. I think I do, but I don't know. Let's talk about them. The Great Crystal is entered via Guru Vagan, which is a very unique level in its own right, featuring strange mechanisms, barriers and glowing paths of semi-corporeal glyphs which materialise in front of your eyes. But at Guru Vagan's end, after a tense encounter with the tyrant boss, the team enters the Great Crystal, which is essentially a different realm of reality. Every single room here, if they could even be called rooms, is made up of glowing glyph platforms, complete with circular barriers which sometimes open to lead up or down to different rooms which could contain anything from some dangerous enemies, treasure, a barrier corresponding to one of the zodiac signs, a switch to disengage said barrier, a teleporter or even a secret boss. The only map you have here is this monstrosity which I always thought was completely fucking useless, but it turns out that the weird names given to each room actually have meanings which can be used to decipher your position within the crystal. 
pretty damn cool idea actually, though I've never engaged with it myself, usually preferring to just sprint from room to room until I eventually, through brute force, develop a somewhat satisfactory degree of orientation so as to make it to my destination, all across the nation. It's a really weird level, very unique and deceptively huge, especially if you're delving into the upper levels, where some of the game's most powerful gear can be found, not to mention the Omega Mark 12, Super Boss and Ultima. And although it can be really frustrating trying to navigate your way through it, and even downright overwhelming at times if you really lose your bearings, I still enjoy moving through it. That thrill of activating a waystone teleporter and not knowing where you'll end up next and what bizarre monsters and unique treasures might await you there. Then there's the Pharos at Ridorana, which must be the single largest level in the game. In fact, that's literally its entire shtick, because there are 100 floors here, divided into three ascents, the first of which involves the collection of black orbs dropped by fallen foes so as to activate the elevator upwards, and then the defeat of specifically coloured facer type enemies so as to construct physical bridges out of phantom segments. Then there's the second descent which has you fight through legions of brutal enemies either without the use of your minimap, magic, the ability to attack or the ability to use items. The choice is yours, though it's kind of a pointless choice to give to the player because the obvious option is to just take away the minimap. Not least of all because 1. You can still just use your regular map just fine and 2. You can still enable the semi-transparent map overlay specific to the Zodiac Age version of the game, which is even better than the minimap. The third ascent is the trickiest and in my opinion most interesting of them all, requiring the use of coloured waystone teleporters which must be touched in the correct order, taking you higher each time towards floor 100, though if you make the wrong choice twice you'll be sent to a brutal hall filled with difficult enemies. And this can really suck, or rather it really sucked in the original PS2 version of the game, because back then there were no autosaves. The game's generally not too merciless with its save crystal placements, but there are a few places in the game where it is pretty rough, for no apparent reason, and one of those is here. I remember what must have been well over a decade ago, playing through the third ascent for about an hour and a half, collecting a ton of loot, gaining a load of levels, and gradually making good progress, but then I got chucked in this room once again, got confused by the Necrofiend's phantasmal gaze at a bad time and died losing all my progress and getting so mad I chucked my phone across the screen and broke its camera. Good times. The Great Crystal is also really stingy with its safe crystals, ironically. Though the worst of all is the special charter dig section of Hen Mines which leads up to Zodiac, which is the single most dangerous field area in the game leading up to the single most difficult Esper boss fight, but it doesn't have a single safe crystal. Fuck you Final Fantasy XII, but also I love you so much. There are some completely optional field areas which you never strictly have to set foot in too if you don't want, like the Zertanen Caverns, the Necro Hall of Nabudis, the Nebrius Deadlands and even Sorobi Steppe, and then there's the Subterra portion of the Pharos at Ridorana. Remember I said that there were 100 floors there? Well, it goes down the way too, and it's way more dangerous down there. Literally right as you get out of the elevator, you get absolutely swarmed by Abaddons and Mistmares, and things only get more fucked up from there. But look, it's Ixion, and who the hell is this? And I guess that brings us nicely around to Final Fantasy XII's combat. We've talked about its plot, its characters and its world, but that's only about half of the picture, because what Final Fantasy game is complete without a massive selection of weird and wonderful creatures and bosses to engage with, not to mention a varied arsenal of powerful weapons and magic with which to dispatch them. Like I said back in the intro, FF12 marked something of a shift in the franchise with the way its combat played out, because now every regular enemy you fight is right out there in the open for you to either run up and engage or give it a wide berth, be it a cute wee cactite having a snooze in the Dalmask and Esther Sand, aww, or a mighty ashworm on the prowl within the enigmatic upper reaches of the Great Crystal. I told you how I reacted to this big change earlier, that being not well because Final Fantasy to me was your random encounters followed by some slow, methodical, turn-based combat. There were all sorts of action games I could have chosen to play for faster paced gaming experiences, but that's not what I was after from this franchise. I wanted a turn-based RPG centering around strategy, preparation and smart decision making, which turned out to pretty much be what I got when I actually played it. 
See, although FF12's combat looks much more action oriented, that's mainly just in its visuals, though it can't be denied that battles can get far more hectic and chaotic in this Final Fantasy when compared to the others with their designated isolated battle arenas which only come into existence upon a battle's beginning and then cease to exist after its end, at least until the next random encounter, and that's largely because 1. You can now freely move around whilst in combat, even while attacking and even whilst being attacked, and 2. Now when you get in a fight there is nothing preventing other nearby monsters from joining in, and 3. Your actions as a player can and will overlap with the enemy's actions. In fact, you'll often find yourself landing an attack on an enemy right as it lands an attack on you, meaning more shit tends to be happening at any one time, compared to in previous entries where only one major action can ever occur at a time. Thus, it's more than fair to say that things feel pretty different in this entry, but not quite as different as they might seem at first glance. For one, both player and enemy actions still operate via turns. It's not like you're just hammering the X button to attack or anything, this ain't Kingdom Hearts. And furthermore, all the action stops when you bring up the command menu, giving you as much time as you need to choose another action for your party leader and everyone else before picking your desired action to be executed the next time your party member's action gauge charges up. The speed of which is governed by the weapon choice and speed stat, though there are other ways to increase a party member's speed like haste or berserk, not to mention the swiftness license. More on the license grid later though. If things are still too fast paced for you, you can even turn the battle speed down in the config menu, but personally I like to walk on the wild side and crank that shit up to 11 please. Of course, there's another major difference with FF12's combat, and that is the gambit system, though even before this gets introduced after meeting Fran and Balthier, many fights can get quite hands off, because after you command someone to attack an enemy, they will simply keep on attacking until either that enemy is defeated or they get KO'd. Once gambits get introduced however, you can get very specific and complex with what your party members will automatically do when engaged in battle. With FF12 being well over 15 years old at this point, I'm not entirely clued up on the general sentiment around it as a whole or its various gameplay systems, though I have in the past heard criticism regarding the gambit system. Gambits are essentially programmable AI scripts for your party. Of course, pretty much every enemy you encounter in the game has much the same feature, and I guess most other games to some degree, except enemy gambits are of course inaccessible and invisible to the player and a bit more complex compared to the gambits you can set up as a player. Probably the simplest gambit you can use is to have your party members automatically begin attacking the nearest visible enemy, saving you from having to manually target it yourself. But then, what if you have all three party members using this gambit when there are multiple enemies nearby? It means that everyone's going to end up attacking different enemies depending on which they're closest to, which is pretty much never desirable. This isn't a game where it makes sense to spread out the damage, and it's most definitely not one where you want to have multiple enemies around who are at critical HP levels. Thus, you can add an additional gambit command at a higher level of priority to specifically target whichever enemy the party leader is targeting. But then what if someone gets KO'd? I hear you ask. Well, why not set up an additional gambit above even the attack ones so that your party leader or whoever else will instantly use a phoenix down whenever someone bites the dust, or if you've got a white mage, have them cast raise or arise, which is a bit slower but which will restore more HP in the process. You can even set up gambits to be used strictly outside of battle by placing them below all attack gambits. I like having it so that my party is always covered by protectica and buffs like bravery and haste. It makes it so that if I'm running around a field area and the buff runs out, well because I've set up a gambit for it, someone will automatically recast it so that I'm always nice and buffed up for any upcoming encounters. Now those were just some basic ones I went over there, but if you're really into this stuff and are the kind of player who gets a kick out of optimising your party setup, you can get really involved with gambits. You don't start out with them all from the beginning, but you can purchase them at the gambit shops located in every city, and for cheap too. In fact, I've always thought that the game could have simply done away with the gambit stores entirely and just given you them all from the start, though I guess they didn't want new players to be too overwhelmed when they opened the menu and saw pages of very specific conditions and commands. Like I said, you can get really specific with it, like having specific party members use particular abilities on enemies with specific weaknesses, status effects or even relative levels of defence or speed, and the same is true on the defensive side of things. 
one of the most dangerous status effects in the game is Confuse, because it can very quickly result in things spiralling into chaos, especially in the late game when you're taking on groups of super dangerous enemies. Coupled with the fact that by that point in the game, one hit from a party member can easily KO another, and so it's a very good idea to have the Gambit ally status Confuse with the action New Kai Sand, and you'll probably want to set it to the highest priority too. Mind you, for the vast majority of the game, it's really not all that necessary to get too technical with gambits. I personally like to keep things pretty simple and then only have a play around with them if I'm really struggling on a boss, though for this latest playthrough that literally didn't occur until I took on the Behemoth King, who I'd say is in the top 5 most challenging encounters in the game. For that enemy, I felt that a good gambit setup was just about crucial for success, but as for nearly everything else, a good gambit system felt more like a convenience, which goes back to the main criticism I've heard regarding FF12's core combat, that being that it's kind of there for the player to do less. I mean, I just spoke about setting up your shit so that negative status ailments automatically get healed with the corresponding item and enemies with specific elemental weaknesses get automatically targeted with that corresponding elemental spell, etc, etc. But it kind of raises the question of, hey, why can't you just do all that yourself, you lazy bastard? Which I do get. I mean, objectively, the optimal gambit setup would be one where you never even need to select any specific action yourself, instead just approaching an enemy and letting the rest play out and then moving on to the next enemy, in a situation where the game is partially playing itself, which might sound kind of shit and pointless, except it's not. See, I think the reason it works, at least for me, is because of the very nature of FF12's more free and open combat and these wide open spaces which are filled with a lot of enemies. Now, let me preface this next point by stating that I haven't done this, but if I was to count the number of enemies I'd killed after 40 hours of playing FF12 versus 40 hours of your more traditional random encounter based games like FF7 or FF10 or even the retro Final Fantasies, then I think FF12 would probably have any other Final Fantasy game beat even if you multiplied its kill count by 2. For as much as I love this game's combat, I will admit that individual battles don't feel quite as meaningful or impactful in this game compared to the others, not least of all because of the lack of those traditional audiovisual elements to initiate and end the fight. There's not much fanfare from one battle to another, but rather you're moving through big open spaces and taking care of business, from one pack of enemies to the next, and there are a lot of enemies. I think this is one of the reasons why the Gambit system specifically works in this game, whereas it would not work at all in something like FF10. There are a lot of Panthers and Marlboros in Goldmore Jungle, but I just don't need to be making every decision for every battle. I know my team are strong enough, I know my gear is up to scratch, and I know my Gambits are set up so that if I get hit by a blaster or a bad breath, someone's going to throw out a Remedy or an Izuna to fix it right up and if things get really out of hand, I can instantly take control and start throwing out commands to get the situation back on track. I definitely don't want to make it seem like this is a game that practically plays itself though, because it really isn't. For as much as the capacity is there to set things up in a certain way so that problems get resolved the instant they appear, it often doesn't work out so neatly. Like I said earlier, battles can get chaotic as hell and it's very easy to get overwhelmed, especially if you step out into a level that you're not supposed to be in, like if you take a trip down into the Zertanen Caverns too early and get absolutely annihilated by a level 86 Archeo Avis, or venture a bit too deep into Gomor Jungle to the point where you start seeing hellhounds and dinosaurs, or you find yourself in the Necro Hall of Nabudis after straying too far from the relative safety of the Salaka Wood before getting savaged by a pack of back Maze. That's not to say that the only times you'll find yourself in any danger is when you're under level though, because the game does frequently make sure to keep you on your toes even in regular areas with regular monsters, and especially when it comes to the bosses and hunts, and extra especially when multiple negative status ailments start getting thrown at you. Thus, throughout my playthroughs I found gambits to be a great tool for expediating the process of moving through field areas, being a great help in battle until you come up against something you're not prepared for, in which case it's time to turn off cruise control to start micromanaging the situation and taking matters into your own hands. One of the tricks that you might really feel the need to pull off when shit does hit the fan and your party members are getting killed just about as fast as you can revive them are quickenings. 
quickenings are essentially FF12's version of the limit breaks or overdrives, being very extravagant and capable of dealing massive damage, all whilst the enemy is frozen in place. The first time I tried one out in battle, I had absolutely no fucking idea what was happening, because I didn't bother to read the in-game traveller's tips on the subject, and my adolescent brain was too overwhelmed by the flashing colours on screen to discern what my next course of action should be. But upon initiating a quickening, you have the chance to chain an additional one by pressing the corresponding correct face button next to another quickening attack down in the bottom right, either from the same character or from another, providing they're not KO'd, confused, berserked, etc. If none of the attacks shown are highlighted in white, then you can shuffle the options and hope one does appear, or if your missed charges are depleted, the resource that lets you use these special attacks in the first place, then you want the missed charge option to show up, which does exactly what it sounds like, priming that character for additional quickenings. Every party member has three different quickenings to unlock, which, as you'd expect, get more powerful, from Van's Red Spiral to his Pyroclasm, from Fran's Feral Strike to her Shatterheart, and from Balthier's Fires of War to his Element of Treachery. Frankly, my dear, these attacks look sick as fuck, and it's a real thrill to chain together as many as possible before that 4 second timer runs out. In the early stretches of the game, you probably won't be getting any crazy high chains, especially if you've only got 1 or 2 level 1 quickenings unlocked, but even so, it can make for some incredibly satisfying moments. I'm sure everyone remembers that first time you venture out into the Dalmascan Ester Sand, which is almost exclusively populated by wolves and cactites in its first segment. Well, except for the goddamn T-Rex prowling around that is. You know, the one that can literally devour nearby enemies to make itself stronger. I know I've been enthusiastically singing the game's praises for this entire video thus far, but I'm going to continue to do that here, because I love shit like this. Placing an especially intimidating enemy very early on when you're still really weak, letting you see what the game has in store for you, and giving you a harsh lesson in humility if you decide to piss it off. Because I don't care how optimised your gambits are at this point in the game, you ain't killing this thing yet. In fact, you literally can't access gambits at all the first thing you come out here because they aren't unlocked yet. You've got no chance. Heck, even if you come back here another 4 to 6 hours later, you'll likely still get flattened by it, if you try and fight it conventionally that is, but unleash a long flashy chain of quickenings, building up the damage with each attack whilst being totally immune to any damage yourself, and then dealing in excess of 100 times the damage that you could pull off with a regular attack, well, cathartic moments like that are the reason I get up in the morning, the one and only reason. Of course, the cherry on the moist cupcake with quickenings is that depending on how many of them you chain together, and based on how many of them are level 1s, 2s or 3s, you will get an additional AoE after effect known as a concurrence. There are 8 of these based on the game's elements. You've got Inferno, Cataclysm, Torrent, Windburst, Whiteout, Arc Blast, the particularly dazzling Luminescence, and the most powerful of them all, Black Hole. Though even though they do all correspond to specific elements, they do non-elemental damage, meaning you'll never inadvertently find yourself healing an enemy instead of hurting it. Even though you won't be pulling them out all the damn time, I think the quickenings are really important for elevating the overall flashiness of the game's combat, because I have always found it to be somewhat lacking in that department, at least when compared to my other favourite Final Fantasy games. Yes, the environments look incredible, and yes, there are absolutely some amazing looking enemies and bosses, but with the new capacity for free movement during fights, both for you and the enemy, there's not as much room for the kinds of outrageous enemy attack animations which were so common in the previous games. You're going to be seeing a lot of rakes, screw tails, and the occasional bad breath, and even the occasional white breath, but not quite so much of the more cinematic shit. A lot of bosses do have special attacks, but they tend to look quite generic, looking very similar to concurrences, like the Firemane's Bushfire, the Elder Worm's Sporefall, or literally any special attack by an Esper boss. Mind you, the Espers do tend to provide some of the sickest visuals in the game, specifically when you are using them, and I'm specifically talking about their special moves. Of course, summons have been around in one form or another since Final Fantasy III, introducing staples of the series like Ramu, Shiva, 
Ifrit and Titan, though from then up until Final Fantasy IX, they served as super flashy special attacks with long grand animations, dealing massive damage to all enemies or even providing other benefits like how Carbuncle casted Reflect on your whole party in FF5 or how Phoenix also revived everyone in your party in FF7. Then FF10 came around and allowed you to actually take control of the creatures you summoned, each of which had a regular attack, a special attack, a selection of magic relevant to their specific element and an overdrive. As for FF12, well it has espers, a selection of 13 weird and wonderful mystical beings to be summoned in battle alongside the specific party member who brought them forth. Of course you've got to find them first and then fight them. Of the 13, only 5 are actually mandatory, being encountered naturally through the story. First Belius in the Tomb of Wraithwall, then Matthias in the Still Shrine of Miriam, then Shem Hazai in Geruvagan, followed by Hashmal in the Pharaohs at Redorana, followed directly by Famfret, who gets summoned halfway through the awesome second fight with Dr. Sid. The others are more elusive though, either being situated in optional field areas like a Dramalek lurking in the centre of the Zertanen Caverns, or like Ultima, who is secluded far beyond some of the most dangerous parts of the Great Crystal, while others are tied to side quests of varying length and complexity. At the simpler end you have Zeramis, who can simply be accessed by talking to an acolyte in Mount bar after defeating Judge Bergen, who will give you the Stone of the Condemner, allowing access to where Zeramis waits within a hidden section of the Still Shrine of Miriam. Then, at the other side of the spectrum of complexity, you have Chaos, who has multiple interweaving side quests required to be completed before being able to access him, putting you through sequence puzzles, having you do detective work around Rabinaster, following up various leads, making you watch a low-key tearjerker of a cutscene where these three old Numo dudes sacrifice themselves, and then having you fight two formidable bosses in the Necro Hall of Nabudis before eventually allowing you to face off against Chaos himself. As far as the actual battles go against these creatures, they play out exactly the same as regular bosses, having lots of HP and some fancy attacks, and sometimes even having extra minions who join in the fight, annoyingly. Every Esper boss has a special attack corresponding to their element, like Blizzardja, Aquaja, Darkja, but I found it to be a bit of a shame that this is the case, because although they look kinda of flashy, they're also pretty generic. And also, when you're controlling them, the Esper special attack animations are without a doubt some of the coolest in the game, but you could easily go a whole playthrough without seeing a single one. To be honest, on my most recent playthrough, I probably would have gone the whole way myself without seeing any of these if I wasn't making this retrospective, because to be perfectly honest, I have never felt the particular need to actually use an Esper, other than for shits and giggles. A big reason for that is just how vulnerable you are in this game. See, no other Final Fantasy game I've played makes death seem like more of an inevitable and sometimes constant occurrence than Final Fantasy XII. I don't mean death as in a game over, where all party members get KO'd, both your primary and backup teams, but I mean individual party members getting KO'd and having to be revived. 
A lot of enemies hit really freaking hard. They can sometimes chain together attack after attack until you are dead, and a significant feature of this game's combat, and one I'm not hugely fond of, is that some enemies become much, much more powerful when their health gets very low, as in, they'll start doing significantly more damage, taking significantly less damage, and become much harder to hit. In fact, this is when your quickening chains really come into play, because sometimes towards the end, an enemy can simply feel too powerful to fight conventionally, even though they were perfectly manageable for the first 90% of the fight, necessitating a big finisher during which you cannot be attacked yourself. Thus, whenever I found myself in a challenging boss fight, the time simply never felt right to summon an Esper, because one nasty attack or string of attacks on the party member who summoned them and away that Esper goes. Mind you, the Zodiac versions of the game introduced a pretty sick feature, where not only can you now choose which actions the Espers perform, but you can directly control them. You could not do either of these things in the original. The same is true of guest characters in your party who you couldn't command at all before, or modify their gambits, or even have them level up. I actually had no idea you could control espers in this version, in fact, this footage on screen now is where I discovered it by accident after I got pissed off with Exodus moving so fucking slowly through the level, and on a whim, randomly tried to select it as the party leader, only for it to actually work. And you can even send out a finisher move now whenever you want, whereas it was all AI controlled in the original. In fact, sometimes if you got unlucky, your Esper would leave the battlefield without you even getting to see these incredible animations, which is a sin. In short, I love that Espers are in the game, coming in some very weird designs, having dazzling finisher animations and having some excellent quests tied to them, making the game world feel that bit more alive and mysterious, especially if you weren't expecting to run into them that day. But ultimately, and mechanically, I do feel that they are somewhat superfluous in that you just don't need to use them. But look, there's more to this whole story than simply wiping out dozens of monsters in every level, because the pure mechanics of it are complemented by other elements which make it feel all so rewarding and fun. In fact, I'm not exaggerating when I say that Final Fantasy XII is one of the most satisfying and rewarding games I've ever played, and a massive part of that literally is the rewards, so let's talk about those. Before this game came along, your primary source of earning gil in Final Fantasy games was by winning battles. Maybe you knew a good farming spot where the enemies yielded the big bucks, or maybe you had a passive ability on a piece of equipment to multiply your earnings, but be it a hell house or a mimic, enemies dropped gil. Well, in FF12, with very few exceptions, enemies do not drop gil. Instead, they drop loot. Now, back when I was first introduced to this system, I didn't really get it, and I didn't particularly like it. I mean, loot's main purpose is to be sold for gil, so why have this extra seemingly unnecessary step in the middle? Well, there are a few reasons, but after what must be over 350 hours of playtime in this game over multiple playthroughs spanning back over 15 years, the main reason is... It's fun. Nearly every enemy in the game can drop loot upon being defeated. You won't always get a drop, but around half the time you will, leaving a glowing bag on the ground to be picked up, making a satisfying wee jingly noise upon being collected. Monsters have multiple different pieces of loot they can drop though, of varying rarities. Take the Cerberus, found in the Feywood for example. It has a 40% chance to drop a Prime Pelt, a 25% chance to drop a Fire Crystal, a 5% chance to drop a Francisca, which is actually a weapon, and a 1% chance to drop a Libra Gem, though if you have yourself the Hunter's Monograph, there's an additional 5% chance to get a Hellgate's Flame. Anyone who has ever went through the ordeal of trying to unlock the Tournus Sol will have keen memories of farming these burning bastards for Hellgate's Flames, I'm sure. Thing is though, these drop rates are not fixed, because there's an additional mechanic here called Chain Bonus, where the more enemies from a particular category you defeat in a row, the higher the drop rate percentages get for rarer loot, and you can even get multiples of the same type of loot from the one drop. It doesn't have to be the exact same enemy for the Chain Bonus to continue, like here, I could take down both Cerberuses and Tartaruses, and the Chain will continue because they're both wolf type enemies but if I went and nailed a Deadly Nightshade or Golem in the same area, then the chain is broken. 
it is very satisfying to build up a massive chain bonus because you can get rewarded with silly amounts of loot which means silly amounts of gil when you sell it all off at a vendor upon getting back to town. Furthermore, as your chain grows, the loot icons themselves also get larger and larger, making even louder and jinglier jinglier jingly sounds, and even giving you little boosts to your MP. It's pure dopamine hit after pure dopamine, and I love it. It's a little bit shakily implemented though. As I said, it feels great to get a really big chain bonus going, but in reality, this doesn't happen very often at all, because areas are almost never filled with the same enemy type. There's usually several completely different ones, and so you sometimes need to deliberately try and run by certain enemies, missing out on the loot that they would give you, hoping they don't attack you in the process as you're sneaking by. You almost always really need to force it, other than in places like the Sand Sea, where you'll often be running into many all rounds or Uritan Yenses in a row. The absolute best way to get ridiculous bonuses going however is in areas where you have either zombies or skeletons spawning from the ground, like in this part of the still shrine of Miriam, the place in the neighbourous deadlands where you fight the Roblon or my personal favourite, the Zeramis boss arena after he's been beaten. As discussed, the field areas can get really big, and the dungeons especially labyrinthine, and as such, you can be out for hours before you naturally find yourself back at a city or outpost, meaning that by the end of any long expedition, you'll find yourself with a bag near bursting with loot, and the more dangerous the dungeon, the more valuable your bag of loot. In my near 25 years of gaming experience, I have encountered few things more satisfying than returning back to a vendor after an hour or two or three of fighting monsters with a bag full of loot to sell it all off. Sure, in the more traditional Final Fantasy games, you might have made a lot of gil after a big dungeon, but in FF12 the gratification is delayed, making it feel that much more intense <laughs> when it comes round. You'll nearly always have your more basic constants like stones, magicite or crystals corresponding to particular elements which don't sell for all that much, but it's the stranger and more exotic stuff that fetches the big bucks, especially if you've got a lot of them. Prime pelts, Marlboro flowers, mithril, behemoth stakes, demon eyeballs, blood darkened bones, beast lord horns, look, I'm not going to sit here and list every piece of loot in the game, because there are too bloody many. But even though there's no visual representation of them, just the names and descriptions of them can be enough to give me a thrill when I pick it up, especially when I think of how much they might be worth, and especially if it's something I've never gone before. For example, even on my latest playthrough, I didn't know there was a piece of loot called Eye of the Hawk. It's just never dropped from me before, but hey, this random vulture yielded one, and now I can sell it, and hey, it happens to contribute towards a particular bizarre recipe which I'm a wee bit closer to unlocking, bringing us nicely on to the bazaar, another great aspect of the game's loot system. Although it's all invisible and in the background, when you sell loot, it gets added to a counter which tracks the loot requirements for special items accessible only via the bazaar menu. For example, here I met the requirements for unlocking the Light Spear Bazaar item, which is the Javelin weapon, unlocked after selling 2 horns, 2 foul flesh and 3 windstones. Or here, I've unlocked the Memory of Your Bazaar item after offloading 5 quality stones, getting me 99 pebbles. Yes! Except not really because they don't actually do anything, but these are the exception, because there's around 100 different recipes for all sorts of different stuff from bundles of items, to armour, to some of the rarest and most powerful weapons in the game. Most of the bizarre items you unlock will simply do so as a result of you just going about your business, nailing monsters and collecting loot, but if you want the good shit, be prepared to farm, and farm a lot. Now, for this playthrough I didn't do much farming because I don't have all the time in the world when preparing for a video, and so certain indulgences must sadly be skipped. But I did go for the Silver Bow Bizarre item, which unlocks one of the best bows in the game, requiring 3 Beast Lord Horns, 3 Moon Rings and 4 Sagittarius Gems, and costing a pretty penny at 100,000 gil. The Moon Rings I'd already managed to get naturally after taking down enough Ash Worms in the Great Crystal, but Beast Lord Horns I had to farm from Humbabas in the Mosferin High Waste, having an 8% drop rate with the Knight's Monograph and taking me around 20 minutes to farm all three. And as for the Sagittarius Gem, 
That must have taken me a bit over half an hour for me to steal all four from the Fubar Flan enemies in the Nabrius Deadlands, though all this is nothing compared to some other bizarre requirements, with the most egregious example being, of course, the Tournesol, the most powerful greatsword in the game. Now, while I did not go for the Tournesol on this playthrough, I have went for it on previous playthroughs. Twice, in fact, and it takes a damn while. I mean, it does only require 9 items to be fair, 3 nuggets of gem steel, 3 imperial souls, and 3 serpentariuses. Cool, so which enemy drops a gem steel? Well, other than a level 99 red chocobo which has a fewer than 1 in 250% chance of spawning in Osmond Plains, none of them do. Instead, the gem steel itself is a bizarre item, itself requiring very rare ingredients and a lot of farming, same with the Imperial Soul and the Serpentarius, each of which you require three of. Honestly, I only have one minor criticism of the bizarre feature, and that's that I'd have preferred there be a way of tracking what you've sold and what is still needed to fulfil recipes, because as it is, you'll have no idea unless you've been tracking it yourself. Also, I guess whether or not this all sounds like fun in the first place entirely depends on your attitude towards farming and grinding and such, but my own feelings are that if the game's mechanics are fun, then I don't mind farming. In fact, I have great memories from when I was younger, spending hours stealing Damascus steels from the Blue Sang in Sarobi Steppe, and killing basilisks by the hundred in the Feywood for Serpent Eyes. If FF12 did not have loot, and instead simply had enemies dropping gill like normal, I really don't think it would be anywhere near as fun, because those repeated bursts of anticipation any time an enemy drops something after death really are effective at keeping me engaged even a hundred hours into a playthrough. I've discussed the gambit system and how to some extent battles can be made to play out semi-automatically, and that I'm okay with that, but the only reason it works is how effectively and interestingly the game rewards you, not only with loot, but also how your characters develop over time, combining both new and old systems in a fusion I very much enjoy. The Final Fantasy franchise is of course no stranger to including interesting and creative systems to make the process of going from a piss-weak low-level chump to a blazing high-level powerhouse that extra bit engaging. The older games had variations of the job system, FF7 had the superb materia system, FF8 had all that shit with the, the guardian forces and stuff, I don't know, it's been a while since I played it. FF9 allowed characters to learn abilities via AP points earned from equipment, and for my personal favourite of all, FF10 had the Sphere Grid, which I absolutely loved. It's such a shame we will never see anything like it again in this franchise. FF13 featured a sort of pale imitation of it, but was significantly more linear and streamlined. As for FF12 though, well, it introduced the license board, another system that I really like, not as much as the sphere grid, but still, it's great. When you defeat an enemy, your party are rewarded with LP, or license points, or two points for larger enemies, or more still for rare game, or even more than that for vanquishing marks or beating bosses. Unlike how EXP is shared out, it doesn't matter who lands the final blow, everyone gets a point, even your backup team. Another difference between EXP and LP is how they scale. Enemies at the start of the game will generally only award you with very low amounts of EXP, but this will gradually increase as you start taking on fiercer monsters to the point where by the end you'll be netting thousands of EXP per kill. With LP though, most enemies in the game give you just one. Here's me killing a level 7 cockatrice in the Dalmask and Estersand for 6 ESP, shared up between my 3 party members for 2 EXP each, and 1 LP for everyone too. But now here's me killing some level 60 mom bombs in the Great Crystal for well over 4,500 EXP, again shared between my crew for a bit over 1,500 EXP apiece, but still just the 1 LP each. Thus, accruing points on your license is all about the quantity of enemies killed over quality. It makes it so that even when you're overleveled for an area you might find yourself having to move through, it's still worthwhile taking down the low level enemies along the way for the LP, not to mention the loot. But also, the fact that you still get just one LP most of the time for even higher level enemies doesn't make them feel any less rewarding because 1. You're still getting loads more EXP than you would for easier enemies. 
2. You're still getting more valuable loot, and 3. LP becomes relatively less valuable from the midpoint of the game onwards anyway, after you've gotten most of the licenses you really want and are just left with the ones for accessories and equipment that you probably won't even use. I guess I should now talk about how the license board actually works now that I've covered how the points work, though to be honest it's pretty damn simple, or at least it was before they refined it all for the Zodiac versions of the game, forcing you to think about your choices more carefully. Licenses essentially act as permissions, for want of a better term, to use owned abilities or even equipment. You may have purchased Kuraga or Darkra at the magic shop, but unless a given party member has the license for that spell, they cannot use it, regardless of how high their MP or magic power stats are, and the same is true for equipment. You might have found a sick new weapon in a treasure pot somewhere, but you got to purchase the license first with LP, and conversely, buying the license for something doesn't mean shit unless you actually own that thing. There are many other license types too though, some which act as basic but permanent stat increases while others bestow buffs which will from then on automatically activate once a condition has been met. For example, you have Battle Lore which improves a character's physical attack damage by increasing their strength stat, but then you have a license like Focus which buffs damage by an additional 50% when that character is at full health, or Inquisitor which automatically restores some MP after that person deals damage. Thus, some licenses are rather dull and unexciting but still important, while others have a much bigger impact. For example, the channeling licenses are extremely important for mages, decreasing the MP cost of every spell by 10%, and then you have the swiftness licenses which are extremely important for literally everyone, increasing the speed of their charge time by 10%, and bear in mind that multiple copies of licenses like this can exist on the license board, making for some pretty substantial differences in party member effectiveness from the start of the game compared to at the end. In the original version of the game, there was simply one large board containing every single license, with each party member having their own isolated board, and by that I mean while every version was identical, one party member buying a license had no effect on whether any other character could also buy it, apart from with espers, those are character specific. I guess it's similar to FF10's sphere grid in that sense, though there was a bit more capacity to manipulate the sphere grid for others too in that game through the use of things like strength spheres and HP spheres, etc. Every party member started on a different part of the board, encouraging them down the path of using specific weapons and armour, but you could essentially choose to develop them near identically if you really wanted, which was an aspect of the original which drew very well deserved criticism. It was entirely possible to have every party member capable of wielding any weapon and wearing any armour, and capable of casting any magic and using any technique, with the only real difference between them being their quickenings, which other than their animations, don't really do anything to meaningfully differentiate one character from the next. In fact, not only was it possible to develop your characters in this way, or at least have them end up that way by the end game, but it was simply the optimal way to go about things. Why have just one or two party members specialise in black magic when you can have everyone do it? Why have every character using different weapon types when you can just arm them all with the strongest currently available weapon at that point in the game? What's that? Someone's been KO'd? Hey no problem, I'll just have literally any one of my six party members cast a rise to restore them to full health. I always enjoyed the license board in its original form, but it was certainly in need of some refining. Well, the Zodiac versions did indeed introduce that refinement, combining the board with a job system. Instead of having one massive board, you must now choose a job for each party member, providing them with a much smaller but more specialised board to develop on. And just a bit into the game you get the option of choosing a secondary job for everyone, expanding each party member's versatility. Furthermore, if you're not happy with your choice for someone, you can actually get all your LP back and just pick a job or two, which is nice. Now you don't get to have a party where everyone's capable of using Kuraja and available to be equipped with literally any weapon you find, be it a greatsword, gun or katana. Now instead of having 6 healers, you have maybe 2, and instead of anyone being able to cast Protectga, Shelga, Haste or Faith, maybe now you've only got one guy for that. It heavily encourages you to lean in to specific roles for your different party members, rather than having everyone being a jack of all trades, and it gives you a good reason to try out different weapon types. Although it might not be at all obvious at first, there's far more to the game's weapons than their mere attack power stat, which shows up when you're browsing armaments at a shop. 
Well, I guess it is obvious if you read the in-game travels tips page on the subject, but again, I never did as a teenager. In fact, believe it or not, I literally only just bothered to read it at the time of writing. It turned out to be very enlightening. I wish I had read it before though, because I spent ages ignoring some weapon types while favouring others, purely based on their attack power stat. This meant that I never even considered using guns for my entire first playthrough, because going by their attack power stat, they're one of the weakest weapon types in the game. But what that stat does not tell you is that guns also ignore the target's defence, which comes in extremely handy if you're, I don't know, dealing with an enemy with really high defence. Also, there's a bunch of cool ammunition types to find, modifying the gun's element, damage output, and even giving it a chance to inflict certain status effects. The same is also true of the game's other three ranged weapon types, those being crossbows, bows, and bombs. Even amongst the ranged categories though, there are still big differences. For example, guns might ignore enemy defence, but they're also the slowest overall weapon category in the game, whereas bows are one of the fastest types, dealing damage based on the party member's strength and speed stats. Then you have axes and hammers, which are significantly more RNG based, similarly to hand bombs, another ranged weapon type. I was particularly drawn to axes and hammers on early playthroughs because their attack power stats were way higher than all the others, even very early into the game, but then you actually try using one and deal thousands of damage. Guys, I've just found my new favourite weapon. Let's go on for another hit, and actually never mind, now it's doing 12 damage. The damage output of these weapons is very unreliable and highly luck based, which can be fun, but then it could also really fuck you over, especially if you've got a boss on death's door and you just need one or two more good hits, only for your weapon to completely shit the bed. It's great fun trying out the different weapons and seeing if they're for you or not, because it's not like each job can only use one possible weapon, there are still options within each class. That's not to say that every weapon type has equally high potential though. I've always found poles, maces and crossbows to be kind of underwhelming, and even with guns I usually stop using them towards the end of the game, though it's quite possible that I'm just not using them right. And also I don't have much experience with the newer weapons added in exclusively for the Zodiac edition, like the Kanya, Bonebreaker or Tula. Gear really is huge in FF12. I mean, Sure, levelling up matters for improving your base stats, and unlocking new buffs on the license grid is key for giving you that extra edge, but if you're not keeping your party members up to date with the best gear available to you at that time, you will struggle. This also isn't the type of game where it's worth hanging on to your older weapons for long at all though. In the vast majority of cases, any time you replace a party member's older weapon with a newer one, you can just sell the older one. If its stats are inferior, then it's simply inferior. Though in saying that, there was one playthrough I did back on the PS2 version where I chose to collect every single weapon in the game, just for the hell of it. Well, apart from the Zodiac Spear, which to this day I've never actually had, and no wonder when the steps required to actually get it were so bizarrely specific and easy to mess up, though apparently it's somewhat easier to get a hold of in the Zodiac version. Another thing I once did on what I believe was my very first playthrough of the game was to just never buy armour. I just didn't see the point. Boring, I said. Give me badass weapons and such. Piss off with your chanters de Jaleba. Well, turns out you really, really do need armour. I couldn't understand why I was struggling so much, but it was just because I wasn't buying new armours. Though on the Zodiac Age version, I very rarely felt the need to buy any armour at all because of all the good gear I kept either finding in treasure pots or getting as drops. I know that lots of stuff got tweaked heavily in that area, with things being far more forgiving and reasonable now. The one change that I wasn't crazy about was how many abilities are now found. Before, they would simply become available for purchase at places like Balfenheim Port once you reached certain milestones in the game, even some very powerful spells like Dispelga or Scourge, etc. I'm not saying that this was necessarily the most interesting way to have players get new abilities, but even so, if you'd bought the licenses for them and had gotten that far into the game, and had the guilt to pay for them, why not? Well, in the Zodiac versions, lots of the best abilities are now located in treasure pots, and only treasure pots, sometimes out in the middle of bloody nowhere. Take Float, for example. A very common hazard throughout the game's field areas are traps, spinning pink proximity mines of sorts which trigger when you get too close to them, messing up your team in different ways depending on which type of trap you triggered. 
You can't actually see them at all unless you use a technique called Libra, which reveals the location of all traps in the area as well as giving you more detailed information on things like enemy HP and elemental weaknesses and such. Even so, Libra or not, good fucking luck avoiding a lot of these, even if you do know exactly where they are, especially when your other two party members and maybe even a guest character are trailing behind you. That said, there is a trick to allow you to just float over the traps, and that trick's name is Float. In the original it simply became available for purchase after you defeated Judge Bergen, which isn't too early in the game but nor is it super late. But then, nor is it missable, it's right there in the magic shop. Well, in the Zodiac versions, guess where you find the float spell? Right here, in this specific, easily missable chest in this random segment of the Cheetah Uplands. In fact, I did miss it for almost my entire most recent playthrough, and I only eventually found it after I gave in and just looked it up, because I needed it. I was getting blasted to smithereens by explosion, sten needle and fusillade traps galore. It's not just important stuff like float that are placed like this though. The same thing is true of telekinesis which is massively important for dealing with flying enemies, and I randomly came across powerful magics like bravery, faith, shelga and protectica in much the same way, and it felt… weird. Like every time it happened I did a double take, saying to myself, did I just find bravery in a fucking pot? It always made for a nice surprise, don't get me wrong, but like I said it also felt kinda weird and borderline arbitrary, and that's also because of the way treasure is treated in this game. It's not like in the previous games where every chest is laid out in a specific place and contains a specific ability, item or piece of equipment. No, in FF12 the treasure pots kinda operate in a similar way to the percentage based drops from enemies and such. For a start, tons of pots only have a certain percentage chance to appear at all, and then they might have a range of possible rewards upon opening them. They didn't get what you want? Well how about this? Simply move away two screens to a different segment of the level and then come back and try again, because in most cases, treasure pots literally respawn. Thus, it's not just enemies you'll find yourself farming if you want some of the strongest stuff, but also treasure pots. I spent about 40 minutes trying to get a ribbon accessory from a specific treasure pot which has a chance to spawn in the subterra region of Pharos before I just gave up, but when you do get what you want, as ever, it is quite a thrill. While we're on the subject of thrills and rewards, I guess I should now talk about one of my favourite aspects of this game, and that is the hunts. Very early on, before you even set foot in the Dalmask and Esther Sand, in fact, you are introduced to the world of mark hunting by Tomaj in the Sand Sea pub in Rabanaster, who spins a tale of woe about some fearsome fiend terrorising poor couriers out in the desert prompting Van to accept a bill posted on one of the game's many hunt boards, agreeing to vanquish the rogue Tamato, a vexing representative of the deadly Nightshade family which can be found hanging out atop a rocky cliff not too far from the entrance to the city. It's not a difficult fight at all, but it does provide a respectable increase in challenge and engagement compared to the lowly wolves and simple cactites making up the rest of the desert. And there's even a cute wee cinematic at the halfway point, letting you know that you can expect some perhaps unexpected extra flavour in these side quests going forward. The first stage of any hunt is to agree to talk to the petitioner after a new bill appears on the hunt board, after which that petitioner must be sought out who will then give you details on the unique enemy, known as a mark, after which you can venture out to the location provided and hunt it down, before returning back to the petitioner for your well deserved reward. It's the exact same structure used by The Witcher 3 for its contracts. Every single hunt follows this structure and in a lesser game it might all get a bit stale, but this is not a lesser game, and indeed the hunts make for some of the best content in the game and that's because of both the quality of the writing and stories and because of the marks themselves. At the beginning the stories are generally pretty simple, stuff like the Thex Terra which, like the rogue Tomato, has been haranguing couriers and caravans in the desert, specifically the Wester Sand, and so you go out that way, only having to venture a short ways off from the entrance to the city to take care of it. I mean, I say it's simple, but it's still a really cool hunt. The design of the Thex Terra is very sick, and indeed pretty much every mark has a unique design, be it a palette swap and or size difference and or other differences to their shape and character. But after not too long at all, the hunts start turning into proper side quests with great stories, sometimes fun, though other times surprisingly deep, like 
Pilika here in Bujerba had a cute wee pet named Carbo, but one day the pet went missing. Bit of time passed and Pilika started hearing rumours about a massive rock toys rampaging in the Luzu mines and so petitions us to take it down before it causes someone harm. So you go down there and yep, because of how rich the magicite is in the mines, it grew and is now a real danger. So you take it down and return to Pilika only for Carbo to appear again, except all small now. He's a little cutie. Look, maybe I'm just easily impressed, but this is great. It's just one of 45 unique hunts in the game, but it is dripping with personality with a simple but enjoyable mini story with a cool enemy to fight. But then you have a hunt like the crocodile, with the petitioner being located in the centre of Giza Plains, specifically during the rain season, when the nomads there have left. He's here alone, but wants you to slay the crocodile and retrieve a ring. But here, instead of the game telling you exactly where to find the beast, it only gives you clues, telling you the mark is to be found near a bridge. This will happen more with the later, harder hunts, with some telling you exactly where to find the mark, some being far more vague on where it can be found or the conditions to make it appear, while some hunts give you little to no information on where to go at all. These various steps you need to go through can be a bit annoying, especially when you just want to find the fucking thing and beat it, but by and large, they do make hunts more engaging, making you actually have to use your brain as to how to lure it out. Back to the crocodile though, upon beating it you get the ring of the toad which upon taking back to the ghostly petitioner gets you a fat reward, though he also asks you to return the ring to his beloved. If you return to this same zone during the dry season, you can give this ring to the village elder and hear the story of how when she was younger her husband gave her this ring. But when out roaming the plains one day, she lost it, and upon seeing how sad it made her, this prompted her husband to venture out and search for it, even though he knew the much more dangerous rain season was very soon to come, and indeed, he never did return, except briefly many, many years later, to petition some heroic hunter to slay the fearsome beast that killed him decades ago after swallowing his lady's ring, now returned. As you progress through the story, more hunts become available to you, with each having a rank between 1 and 8 based on their level of difficulty, and some of these really are difficult, especially if you get a bit too eager and try taking them on too early. Hunts are an excellent way to break up the main story, to earn some extra gil and get some great gear, and also encourage you to return back to previously explored areas that you might have otherwise ignored for the rest of the game. But rather than me just seeing them as a diversion, I really do consider them to be highlights in their own right. Not all of them of course, I mean, some are quite forgettable, like the Feral Retriever or the Darksteel, but there are a lot of really good ones, and even those with the associated stories aren't super memorable. The monsters themselves are often a pleasure to fight, because they essentially serve as optional boss fights. In fact, you'll pretty much always have hunts available to you at any one time that are way harder than the current story bosses. Probably the first one that truly overwhelmed me was the Ringworm Hunt. It's only a rank 3 mark, making you think it'll be about on par with the other rank 3s in terms of difficulty, but then you venture out into Dalmask and Westersand and see that enormous sand scoured worm prowling around the desert expanse, and maybe you start to get nervous. And then you try and hit it a few times and notice that its health bar has barely gone down at all, which might be around the time when you might realise you're a bit under leveled. That was generally how hunts went for me, I'd be doing well with them, taking out mark after mark before coming up against something that was way more than I can handle, at which point I would simply return back to progressing through the story and regular bosses. The absolute hardest are of course left for the late game though, the rank 7s like Fafnir, the Behemoth King and the dreaded Pile Raster, and my personal favourite Gilgamesh, god damn I love this dude, who like Miguel is also voiced by John DiMaggio. <laughs> now we fight. Seriously, I cannot describe how hyped I was the first time I saw him start to pull out weapons from previous Final Fantasy games, especially the Buster Sword from FF7 and the Brotherhood from FF10. 
really difficult fight too, though he does something that several of the game's hardest marks and bosses do, something I really dislike in fact, where all of a sudden they become immune to damage. Sometimes it's just physical damage, sometimes magic, sometimes they cycle between immunities and sometimes they are completely immune to all damage, and it sucks. As discussed, I'm not a big fan of the significant buffs enemies receive when they are close to death, but they're not egregiously bad or anything. They can just feel a bit cheap, and although I feel like kind of a bitch for saying it, kind of unfair, but having some enemies capable of suddenly turning invincible for extended periods of time is on another level of bullshit, because they can sure as shit still damage you. Speaking of damage, in the Zodiac versions of the game they flat out removed the damage limit. In the original version, apart from a few exceptions, the most you could do per attack was 9999 and for certain bosses, after getting them down below a certain HP threshold, the limit per attack would decrease to 7777, because fuck you I guess. Some enemies in this game have massive levels of HP too. I mean, the boss with the highest HP in FF10 was Penance who had 12 million, then you had Nemesis with 10 million, which is a war but you could deal 99,999 damage per attack in that game, and you also had shit like attack reels and blitzes. Now compare that to FF12, which features Yaezmat, a holy one with 50 million HP in a game where the damage cap was only quad 9s. Then you have the Hell Worm, which comes in at just shy of 9 million, and even monsters with much less HP like the Behemoth King, which had a bit over 1.5 million HP, could be a nightmare when your damage output was so restricted. Though to be fair, if you've got a team who are all hasted up, your attacks are going to be coming out pretty frequently. My point is that I'm glad they removed the damage limit, because it never quite sat well with me in the old days. Though, to be honest, even without the damage limit, most of the time I don't really do more than 9,999 per attack anyway, if at all. And, to be fair, for those super bosses that I just mentioned, their massive HP pools and the fact that they took forever to beat was kind of the point. They were supposed to be marathons. Yaezmat is considered to be the ultimate mark, being unlocked after all other hunts have been completed and the Hellworm defeated. It's to be found in the Colosseum at the Ridorana Cataract and was famous for taking hours upon hours upon hours to defeat thanks to its absurdly large health bar. I have to be honest with you though, I've never actually beaten Yaezmat. The truth is that every time I've tried, I just get bored and abandon it, which surprisingly you can actually do, and then come back with its HP still at the same place where it was before, though if you mess around too much without actually engaging it, it can regenerate literally millions of HP back at a time. Honestly though, one of my favourite things about taking down all these weird and wonderful creatures is getting to read their respective bestiary pages. It's the kind of feature that I really wish more games had, especially FromSoft's games, which boasts some of the most impressive, detailed and interesting enemy designs in all of gaming. But let's not go on another Dark Souls tangent. The beast area is a fairly easy to miss feature being tucked away in the clan primer, but every single enemy, rare enemy, boss and esper in the game has its own entry here, most of which consist of multiple pages, and that same level of writing quality found everywhere else is present here too, with often fascinating explanations and histories into the origins and behaviours of the creatures of Ivalice, not written in a listless academic manner but in fact being very colourful and descriptive, not to mention varied. It makes me extra excited when I encountered some new, particularly strange enemy, because I knew I'd be able to learn all about it in the beast area, and maybe even learn a detail or two about a rare piece of loot that they had the potential of dropping to go towards a specific bizarre recipe. I know the beast area might seem like kind of a minor thing to get so excited about, but it's yet another of the game's many finely crafted and well implemented components, all working together to create a rich, living world with a thoroughly thought out history, just begging to be explored and for its secrets, both ancient and new, to be uncovered. And folks, I think that makes for an excellent time to get us back to the game's story. I covered the characters and setup at the beginning, but let's now discuss how it all plays out. So, as the party are out exploring the world, searching for other pieces of deifacted Nethysite and ancient swords, every now and then you'll get cutscenes about the goings on in Arcades, showing figures like Emperor Gramis, the Senate, Vane, Sid and the Major Judges. 
Through these, you gradually learn more about the dynamic between Vane and his father, and it's shown that several of the Empire's most egregious recent actions are more a result of Vane's ambitions and treachery rather than these being the will of the Emperor and the Senate who are there to act as checks on the Emperor's power to prevent him from ever becoming a tyrant. By this point, however, the Senate has come to fear Vane, detesting him for his ruthless ways and the fact that he acts without due regard for their authority, resulting in Emperor Gramis summoning Vane back to Arcades at their behest, where in a private meeting, Vane pushes the idea that the Senate ought be silenced, having gradually overshadowed the power of House Solidor over the years, even conspiring against them from the shadows. Vane did, after all, wage war against his two older brothers years before who may have been privately spurred on to do so by the Senate, though their deaths also happened to place Vane next in the line of succession, with his younger brother Larsa being the last in line, a character who joins the party as a guest at points throughout the story and who proves to be significantly more just and honest than his brother, his father or the Senate. This truly excellent cutscene showing the final dialogue between Vane and his father cuts out before you get to see its conclusion, but the next time we are shown Arcades, it is revealed that Vane murdered his own father, adding patricide onto his long list of sins, alongside his two existing cases of fratricide. Of course, just as he had one state leader executed before and pinned the blame on someone else, he repeats this here, claiming that the chairman of the Senate poisoned the Emperor before, uh succumbing to his grief, placing himself as the Empire's new commander-in-chief, whereupon he immediately has the remaining members of the Senate arrested for high treason, retaining the loyalty of the major judges, save Drace, who not only sees through Vane's bullshit, but has enough of a sense of justice to attempt to put a stop to him there and then, unlike puss boy Zargabath here. Sadly though, she gets absolutely bodied by Bergen, who has been imbued with superhuman strength after infusing his very bones with manufactured nethesite. Judge Gabranth also appears on the scene here, who Emperor Gramis had previously tasked with protecting the young Larsa with his life, but now, at least partially, siding with Vane, finishing off Drace at his quiet order. At this point, Vane and his half-mad accomplice Dr. Sid are completely free to make use of the military might of the Empire to see their higher plans through to completion, that being to place the reins of history back in the hands of man. But what exactly does this mean? Well, there are gods in Evilace, higher beings who have controlled man's destiny for who knows how many millennia directing their chosen rulers towards the absolute destruction of entire kingdoms who might threaten their godly designs. An example of such a ruler was the dynast king Raithwal, Ash's ancestor, who, with the power of deifacted Nethesite gifted to him by the gods, defeated armies and conquered vast swathes of territory before unifying them under the Galtean alliance, but not solely through his own will, but rather the will of the gods, the Acuria. At first, Ash's main goal is to restore herself as royalty, exposing to the world that she had never actually died and, with the help of the Resistance, taking back control of Dalmasca, but with relations between Rosaria and Arcades becoming increasingly volatile and with the Resistance making things that bit more complicated, Ash's priority instead becomes to nullify the potential impact of the Empire's trump card, that being the deifacted Nethesite, of which Vane and Sid possess both the Dusk Shard and and the Midlight Shard, while the party carry the Dawn Shard, albeit its power depleted after the disaster aboard the Leviathan with Judge Geese. From here on, Ash can't decide whether she wishes to destroy all the affected Nethesite so as to ensure it can never be used by anyone again, or whether she wants to use the power of the Nethesite to restore Dalmasca. She retrieves the Sword of Kings within the Still Shrine of Miriam, which was another relic left behind by King Wraithwall, said to be the only blade capable of destroying Nethesite, but after an encounter with Dr. Sid at Draclor Laboratory, who it turns out is Balthier's papa by the way, the party decide to head to the holy city of Geruvagan, believing that's where Sid is headed next, though rather than there being another appearance by the good doctor there, Ash instead gains an audience with the Acuria deep within the Great Crystal. Here they reveal their influence throughout Ivalice's history, but frame it all as wisdom, insisting the world needs their guidance lest man go astray and the world go awry, and indeed their next directive is for Ash to, with a new sword relic they've gifted her, 
cut a fourth shard from the mother of all deifacted Nethysite, the glorious sun crest within the 100th floor of the pharaohs, and with this shard, destroy the empire, whose leaders have ambitions of dispensing entirely with the will of the Ecuria to become their own masters, though all with the guidance of a heretical Ecuria named Vana, who whispers slivers and nuggets of eldritch knowledge into the ears of Dr. Sebs first and then later Vane, pressing them to kill and conquer so as to get their hands on more deifacted Nethysite to perfect the process of creating manufacted Nethysite. The party make it to the top of Pharos where the sun crest lies, but also Judge Gabrant, who had been ordered by Vane to kill Ash should he have ambitions to act against the Empire. Instead, despite the wishes of the Ecuria, Ash rejects the Nethysite, refusing to use the Treaty Blade to cut forth a new shard, knowing that the destructive revenge it would enable is not the answer. However, Gibranth attacks anyway, furious that she would throw away such an opportunity to destroy the nation which conquered not only her own kingdom, but Gibranth's kingdom too, bearing in mind that his home of Landis was subsumed into Arcadia years before. After the battle, Dr. Sid appears once again, his scheme of having Ash seek out the Suncrest having came to fruition, allowing Vana to incorporate the Dusk, Dawn and Midlight shards back into the Suncrest, causing an immense profusion of mist energy to spill forth from the ancient stone. Speaking of the Midlight shard, by this point an important guest character named Redis has joined the party, a renowned sky pirate and mayor of sorts at Balfenheim Port. He's a very influential figure, having connections with Marquis Halim Ondor, who seeked his help in fighting back against the Empire, but it's not until the battle with Sid that you learn Redis's true identity, that being Judge Zekt, the one responsible for the absolute destruction at Nabudis two years earlier, at least at the orders of Sid and Vane. Afterwards, he became utterly disenchanted with the Empire and sought to redeem himself, building power and influence elsewhere and plotting to stop Sid and his lackeys so that what happened at Nabudis can never be allowed to happen again. After Sid's defeat, the Suncrest continues spilling mist throughout Ivalice, but Redis, being the absolute baller that he is, takes the Sword of Kings and sacrifices himself in a cutscene which never fails to make me tear up a bit. Stop it! You must quit this place. It's reacting. I've not seen its like before. Nay, never this large, never such threat impendent. For Nabudis. Redis! Redis, no! I, Judge Magister, condemn you to oblivion! There's no time for tears though, because even though it was destroyed, the Suncrest served its purpose, that being to bring Bahamut back to life, not in the form of a dragon, but as the largest and most destructive airship the world has ever seen, a sky fortress, a near unstoppable war machine which drank up the mist from Pharos and now hovers ominously over Rabinaster, soon to be the battleground for a war between the forces of Arcades and Rosaria with the resistance led by Marquis Ondor poised to be Bahamut's first set of victims as the pseudo-draconic sky edifice lays waste to dozens of allied airships. 
and thus the stage has been set for the final encounter, that being the Bahamut, now accessible via the Stral. Regarding this final section of the game, for as many times as I've played FF12, this footage here was literally my second ever time actually doing it, to the point where I barely even remembered how the game ended here whilst playing. I usually nail the Pharaohs, spend forever doing the game's insane amount of side quests and hunts and collecting treasure and shit, but then just don't finish it. Because once you board the Bahamut, you're at the point of no return. Got to say though, for as much as I'm loath to cast a sour note over the game's conclusion, I found the Bahamut to be surprisingly underwhelming. I was expecting a long and difficult trek through an enormous epic level, requiring clever navigation and putting me up against the Empire's most formidable remaining forces, but what you get here is barely a level at all, it's short as fuck. Furthermore, it's all disappointingly easy. I know I'm strictly supposed to be talking about the plot here, but please allow me a brief diversion to discuss the game's general difficulty. Now, I'm not sure if the original version of FF12 was flat out way harder, or if it just seemed that way because of how I used to play the game, kinda like a moron, but I have previously considered FF12 to be a game that requires a great deal of grinding. I have memories of having to grind like mad at several points, not just for the difficult hunts and super bosses, but even for some of the story bosses. I never minded the grinding because, as I've thoroughly communicated by now, hopefully, I really like playing this game, but I did have to do it. Well, on this playthrough of the Zodiac Age version, not only did I not have to grind a single time throughout the game's story, but I never even came remotely close to dying. I did die a few times after reloading my earlier save after seeing the game through to its end here to nail all the endgame stuff and to delve into the game's hardest dungeons, but I found myself absolutely smoking nearly every boss, including the final encounters against Gabrant and even Vayne. I still had a ton of fun throughout this playthrough, of course, obviously, but the balancing did feel a bit off, which I think was partly caused by the Zodiac job system, as well as other smaller changes like allowing the player to command and even level up guest characters, having quickenings not be as directly tied to MP, and increasing drop rate percentages across the board. Like I said though, it has been a long while since I've played the original, and my memories of its difficulty might be a bit skewed. Anyway, now that I've ranted and raved about that, let's get back to the game's explosive conclusion. With Seth having been defeated, Vinat is now allied only to Vayne, who plans to utterly destroy the resistance in full sight of Rabin Aster, so as to show that any future uprisings would be completely futile, punishable by a swift and merciless death. Of course, with Larsa being the good-hearted lad that he is, he opposes his brother in this, being appalled at his ruthless disregard for life and peace. Meanwhile, the Stral manages to dock inside the Bahamut, all while a devastating air battle rages in every direction. Further inside, they once again encounter Gabranth, who made it out of Pharos alive after being thrown asunder by Dr. Sid, but sadly, rather than him having learnt his fucking lesson back there, he once again attacks the party, rage and regret for his lost homeland of Landis, spurring him on harder than ever, and especially rage for his brother Bash, who also failed Landis. Gabranth is swiftly defeated once again though, but not killed, with Bash instead leaving him there to stew in his own bitter sorrow, and after rising to the Sky Fortress's higher levels, they come face to face with Vayne, with Larsa by his side. However, rather than the brothers fighting side by side, Larsa turns against Vayne to fight alongside Ash and her crew. Vayne is absolutely no match for us at this point though, and despite a couple of flashy attacks, he goes down pretty easy, prompting Larsa to run to his brother's body before being paralysed upon approach, with his life force being transferred to Vayne via the power of the manufactured Nethysite. It's much the same as how Judge Bergen augmented his own body, but Vayne's augmentations are on another level, significantly expanding his own size and musculature and imbuing him with greatly enhanced power. Again though, of course, he's no match for our crew and is summarily defeated, but once again Gabranth appears, roused to fresh fury at the sight of the fallen Larsa, whom the late Emperor Gramis had tasked him with protecting. He lands a fell blow against Vayne, but also sustains a grievous mortal blow himself in response, and then very nearly another until Larsa wakes up and shatters the shard of Nethysite, giving Vayne his power, distracting him for long enough to allow Van to land the coup de grace. <sighs> 
At this point, Vane is nearly done for, gravely injured and retreating onto an outer section of Bahamut, believing himself to have failed in his goals and missions. However, recall that the ultimate mission of Sed and Vane, and for whatever reason, Vena, was to take the reins of history away from the gods and back in the hands of man, which is indeed exactly what happened when Redis destroyed the Suncrest. It meant that the Acuria no longer had any sway over the humes of Evil Ace, no weapons of mass destruction to tempt them with to manipulate them to destroy their enemies. The very concept of manufactured Nethocyte was considered an unacceptable perversion by the Acuria for this reason, because now not only do humes not require the weapons and guidance of the gods, but they're capable of manufacturing their own weapons, ironically all because of the rogue god, Vanar, who ended up achieving exactly what it wanted. What Vane ultimately wanted was to become the first self-willed dynast king, one to herald a new age now that the Age of Stones is at its end, but after his mortal injuries, that dream is up in smoke. However, Vanar joins with Vane, gifting him with the power of an Acuria, resulting in the creation of Vane Undying, a half-man, half-metallic dragon, and the final boss of the game. Have to admit, this boss actually did give me a wee bit of trouble. I didn't come close to actually dying, but a few party members did get KO'd during the battle, and he also of course does that obnoxious thing of cycling between total immunity against physical damage and magic damage. But, despite having been gifted with the power of a god, the reign of Vane is not to be, being over just as it started, and with that, Ivalice's greatest threat has been vanquished. The team make a grand escape, also managing to have the Resistance and the Empire's remaining forces halt their assault, declaring the war to be over just as it too started, sparing countless Arcadians, Rosarians and Dalmascus from mass death and needless destruction. This doesn't mark the end of the Empire itself though because Larsa becomes its new ruler, and in the place of his brother who died protecting the young lord, Bash becomes Larsa's new protector as a judge, whilst Ash is to be coronated as the Queen of Dalmasca. The whole ending cutscene is essentially an epilogue letting you know that everything turned out okay and everyone's gonna be alright. So what do we think of the story? Well I'll start by saying that I think it's excellent. I love the complexity, all the talk of war and military operations and such, and the three-dimensional way the various players are portrayed keeps it feeling very interesting. Take Vane for example, he's completely ruthless and cold as ice, but he's not strictly evil. He's a very bad man, yes, but there is always a reason for why he is doing things. At the end, when he plans to annihilate the forces of the resistance, it's not simply for the pleasure of doing so, but rather to make sure that another resistance army does not form in the future. Before transforming into his final form, he mentions that he has failed at being the next Dynast King because this is what he wanted to be, a mighty conqueror, swallowing other nations and wiping out his enemies so as to unify Ivelisse under his own rule. It doesn't at all sound dissimilar to what King Wraithwall did, who knows how many died at his orders. Furthermore, even at the very end, he still seems to have some brotherly love for Larsa, when he asks Gabrant to protect him from the coming hell which his new age will bring about before eventual peace. Now, I'm not trying to excuse Vane or anything, I'm not a Vane solid or apologist, I'm just trying to illustrate how he is a villain with actual depth, rather than being a stereotypical bad guy. That's not to say that I think he's a great villain, mind you, because he's not, but I do think he's a good villain. I very much like the game's stilted nature and dialogue, but with a few exceptions like Dr. Sid, Judge Bergen and Al Sid Mark Race, it can lead to its characters coming across as a wee bit wooden at times, preventing me from getting all that attached, and the same is true of your six party members. I like them all to varying degrees, with probably Ash or Pinello being my least favourite, while I enjoyed Balthier the most, but by the end I just didn't feel that emotional connection to them that by rights I should have when playing a Final Fantasy game. I liked the characters, but I didn't love them, though another reason for that is that I actually don't think there's enough character interaction that goes on. Yes, there are quite a lot of cutscenes, especially near the start, but something I noticed is that there are long stretches where your party just aren't talking with one another much, if at all, and even when they are, some characters really fall by the wayside to the point where you barely feel their presence, with it instead feeling like they're just along for the ride. 
I mean, Pinero plays a significant enough role when she gets kidnapped by Begamnin and his crew, prompting everyone to travel to Bajerba to rescue her, but then she has no effect on anything after that point. She might as well just not be there. But hey, don't let me poo poo the game's story over much. I really do like the shit out of it. I'm just belly aching over here. Final Fantasy XII is one of my top three Final Fantasy games, which makes it one of my all-time favourite games full stop, maybe in the top 10 or at the very least just outside of it. Although I had a shaky start with it, I came to very, very much appreciate the changes it brought to the formula and the way it retained many classic Final Fantasy elements, all towards creating a gameplay experience which both felt and still feels interesting, compelling and rewarding. Some of my fondest gaming memories from when I was a teenager are of spending hours wandering the Dalmaskin Estersand and Westersand, killing wolves and cactites and just drinking in the atmosphere complemented by that adventurous, energetic soundtrack. Few games have so thoroughly compelled me to want to beat every monster, uncover every secret, vanquish every mark and boss and find every weapon. In fact, no matter how good a game is, I usually get bored long before even approaching 100% completion, but that doesn't happen with FF12. It keeps me engaged the whole way through. I do have a gripe or two about its story, but they're not major ones, and at the end of the day, I really appreciated the game's unique flavour in its characters and their dialogue, and the world building and world design is some of the best I have ever experienced, which in my view, more than makes up for any minor shortcomings. They did of course make a sequel to this game, that being Final Fantasy XII Revenant Wings for the Nintendo DS, and I'd love to share my opinion of it, but I can't because I haven't actually played it. Have you? Is it good? Is anyone still watching? Who am I? Well folks, I'm at that point in the video where I've started rambling like a madman, and so I think this makes for an excellent time to conclude this whole affair. I really hope you enjoyed my retrospective on this much loved game and I hope you'll stick around to watch other stuff on my channel. Hey, maybe I'll even do a retrospective on Final Fantasy VII one of these days. Please allow me to give a final fond thank you to my kind patrons for their support for the channel. And on that note, as always, cheers for watching and cheerio.